who declare the meeting open and welcome all members um, in the room today. We have, along with myself, we have Kelly Armstrong, Andy Allen and Johnny Buckley. And on the telephone line at the moment, I know we have Carol McKellen, Sinead Innes and Robin Newton. Um, is Mark Durkin on the line? He is. He is. Welcome, Mark. What about Fra? Are you there? No Fra's yet. We'll wait and we'll get Fra will hopefully join us at some stage. Um, so we'll then we'll just push on then and then we'll go directly to item agenda number one, which is apologies. At the moment, there aren't any apologies. I'll move on to agenda item number two, which is chairperson's business. And at the moment, I don't have anything to update you on. Um, item agenda number three is draft minutes. Um, the minutes of our last meeting held on the 29th of April are at page six of your meeting pack. Um, are members content with the minutes of the 29th of April 2020 as drafted? First of all, Kelly, you have something you want to say? Uh, page 11, um, on the list of people who were declaring an interest for the council um, pension scheme. I, I'm not listed. Can I be added in again, please? Okay, no problem. Um, I'll go to the phone lines. Everybody content on the phone lines? Great. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so then we'll move on then. So we all agreed um, as, or as amended. Okay. Item agenda number four is matters arising. There are a few matters arising. First of all, members, um, you've been provided at page 14 with an update or with updated guidance for landlords following the making of the private tenancies coronavirus modifications bill. Can I ask first, are you content with that? Yes, agreed. Okay. Then um, second item then is at page 50, which is the research paper on the coordinating budget scrutiny. Are members content to note that? Could I just ask, um, on page um, 54, it does say that um, the department were to give us a, a briefing um, on the financial position by the 3rd of June. I'm just checking to see, are we going to have that? Yeah, we should be. Yeah, okay. Other members on the phones, are you content to note that item at page 50? Okay, and then there's a, another item then is um, members had asked for an explanation for the use of a phrase in the template developed by RAISE. The phrase was that no conclusory statements please as such responses inevitably will need a clarification. Uh, questions from committee. Um, so the response to that is on page three of your tabled items. Are members content to note the response of page three of tabled items? First in the room, are members content? Just give me a moment. I'm okay, go to the phones. Are members on the telephone lines con content with that? Um, sir, so the, sorry, sir, the phrase came from Ray's then? Yes. Okay. Okay, Kelly, are you content in the room with not, that? Not particularly, because on page 99 um, of our pack today, there is um, information there that, um, you know, it's the Committee for Finance. They're supposed to be the people who are, are looking after that template. I was actually wondering, and I wrote it down here, um, while it may well be raised that's identified in our table papers, um, it's the Committee for Finance that are supposed to be um, ensuring that that template is pulled together. I know that we have a different template, um, a coloured one, but um, I'm just wondering if the Committee of Finance has picked up on that issue and um, their comments on it. Okay, we can send that through and ask. Yeah, yeah we're well, happy to do that. Um, also, the Department has asked for this explanation to be forwarded on to them also. Um, so, members content with that? In the Great. room first, yep. In phone lines, yes. Agreed. Okay. Agreed. Yep. And the final um, item I have under this uh, agenda item, you've been provided at 118 with a departmental update on the response to COVID-19. Um, this was circulated to members last week. Um, it certainly is, uh, it's, it's, it's very good and very explanatory. So we're just asking our members content to note that also. Agreed. Agreed. All agreed in the room as well? Yeah. Okay. Right, members, I'll move on then to agenda item number five, which is a ministerial briefing on Housing Amendment Bill Northern Ireland 2020. Members have been provided at page 120 with a draft copy of the bill. There is also two research papers starting at page 137. So can I welcome Minister Hargey to the meeting? You're very welcome. 
And can I ask, Minister, if you could go ahead and brief us? Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Chair, for that and for the committee um, as well. And I suppose I know that um, there was obviously an expectation in some ways for this to come forward to the committee. Um, and I would have hoped, obviously, for that to be a bit earlier. But with the pandemic, uh, it was delayed slightly. Um, but obviously, just to set out again, it is to thank members um, just for allowing me the opportunity to address uh, the committee and just again to give the need for why I feel this has to have accelerated passage. Um, and again, I know I keep repeating myself in the chamber in here that it's obviously not the way um, to do normal business. Um, but I do hope that you can consider um, the reasons why I'm bringing this forward in the manner that I am. And I suppose the bill is necessary following uh, the 2016 decision by ONS to classify registered housing associations here as public sector. And that was done mainly for a technical reason in terms of the purposes of government uh, accounting. And indeed, that classification um, also happened in England, Scotland and Wales. And on the same day of that ONS announcement, uh, there was a paper submitted to the executive at that time um, by the Finance and Communities Minister outlining just the potential cost and impact that this classification would have. And again, the executive at that point gave approval to start work on reversing the ONS classification. So obviously with the institutions up and running again and re-established this year, obviously it was one of the emerging priorities coming forward. And I suppose on one level the ONS uh, decision is technical in terms of how organisations are treated for the purposes of accounts uh, based on internationally agreed accounting rules. Um, but however, the technical aspect means uh, that the borrowing of organisations classified to the public sector must be treated in a specific way. And this is one of the main concerns and the need to reclassify. I suppose the borrowing uh, counts as public sector borrowing and departments then must provide uh, cover for the borrowing of their budgets. This would have uh, an adverse impact on our current approach to building social homes uh, here. And we obviously know from the waiting list that that demand is increasing, not decreasing. So in a way, housing associations um, who match fund the capital grant, which is made through the department, through their borrowing in the private sector, this would no longer be able to be done because of the current classification. And that would see the volume of social homes uh, each year reduced by 50%. So this is one of the damaging impacts um, if the classification was to remain as it is. Obviously, I'm appearing before yourselves today um, to give you the opportunity to discuss the bill. I fully recognise um, that you're not giving it the full scrutiny in that I'm asking for accelerated passage. But obviously, there are a number of reasons for this and why it is urgent um, that we pick this up. And the first is that the Treasury have allowed a derogation um, in relation to the accounting impacts on the ONS decision. But that was contingent, and they've clearly stated this in their correspondence, on, um, on us moving as quickly as possible to reverse the ONS decision. And indeed, that has been done in Scotland and Wales as well. Um, this derogation was extended again, obviously, because of the institutions not being up and running. And the current derogation ends um, in March 2021. We know that it's highly unlikely, and the Treasury have said this, um, for a further extension. So there is a need for us to move on this reclassification as soon as possible. And I suppose more urgently, the reason that I'm bringing it in this form is that housing associations... Um, lost their eligibility through this to access financial transactions capital, obviously the government's uh, loan scheme. Um, and that is used in the last few years, obviously, to support the increased uh, home ownership through affordable housing programmes. So that has been impacted also. Um, the co-ownership scheme has been supported um, over uh, 2,000 households in the last two years in terms of uh, getting their homes. Um, and without that financial transactions capital, they would be forced to close to new applications um, unless there was an alternative source of funding. Now, we have been working with them, obviously, within the department over the last while um, in terms of maintaining a level of co-ownership houses, but that has been at a cost of £3 million per month. 
and obviously we could be using that three million with the reclassification in uh, the housing development programme. So there's a financial reason um, very clearly why we need to do this and the impact of not doing it is up to three millions per month. And obviously in the context of COVID, uh, new priorities emerging, new challenges emerging, we obviously need to use our budgets um, in, a, in an efficient way um, as possible. Um, I suppose without accelerated passage, there is a risk that the derogation won't be renewed um, going next year. And the cost of maintaining the co-ownership scheme by my department within this year could be an additional £36 million. And again, there would be a challenge as to where we would find that money, as I just said, in the context of COVID with new challenges emerging. Um, even with accelerated passage, uh, there's still a spend of £3 million uh, per month uh, to maintain the co-ownership scheme until we can get that reversal done. So that's why the accelerated passage uh, is so important. Um, and I suppose that is the main thrust. Uh, we do have Chair uh, Paul Price, Heloise Brown and Shane Clements. There are obviously eight amendments to the bill. Um, and I would ask if it's okay that if Shane can just talk the committee if they want through each of those clauses and what it means. Yep, I think that would be helpful. Uh, good afternoon, um, Chair. Good afternoon. Uh, Shane, Shane Clements here from the department. Um, I just wanted to quickly go through what the, um, the various uh, clauses um, will do to the existing legislation. Um, as Minister has said, this is largely technical and our aim in bringing this forward is to try and uh, ensure reversal but at the same time maintain the sort of regulatory regime that we currently have. So. Um, just going through the, the main eight clauses, uh, clause one uh, changes the current consent process for housing associations to a notification process. So rather than um, uh, seeking our consent, uh, they would notify us after they had uh, disposed of a property. Um, it, the, the key issue here is that that consent uh, was, was an interruption of their business, if you like, that ONS decided was control. Um, the key result that we will have is that our regulator will still have access to exactly the same information as they currently do. It will just come in after the event rather than before <coughs> the event. Um, clause 2 then um, frames the um, timing or, or frames the, 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 the ability of the regulator to initiate an inquiry. The current legislation simply says um, uh, if there's been misconduct or mismanagement, which ONS felt was a very broad term. So what we have done, this um, inquiry, the inquiries now will happen where the regulator um, is, is, has reasonable grounds to suspect that an RHA is failing or has failed to um, comply with the duty in, in a whole range of legislation. So not just the housing legislation, but for example, health and safety legislation or legislation governing, governing um, the installation of gas, uh, boilers, the financial uh, regulations as well. So it, it just spells out when we would likely take an inquiry. Um, clauses three and four apply that same framing, if you like, to the sanctions that the department or the regulator has against um, a housing association that has been found to uh, fail uh, one of those uh, legislative requirements um, uh, as a result of an inquiry. And those two powers currently can only be used after an inquiry has been held, and that would continue to be the case. Um, Clause 5 removes the department's power to petition for the winding up of a housing association. Um, uh, that's one that we have we've never actually used, and and in common with a lot of the 
the changes that are being introduced. Um, it, it is not so much the practicalities of whether or not we have used the power or the, uh, that ONS looked at. It was simply the fact that it existed. Um, clause 6, a little bit like Clause 1, replaces a, a current consent process with a notifications process. Um, and the same will apply in that all of the information that they would have supplied us with uh, during a, a, the consent process, they will supply as part of the notifications process. Um, clause 7, then, is, uh, it abolishes the statutory and the, the house sales scheme for RHAs. Um, this was a, a, an area of difference between Northern Ireland and all of the other jurisdictions in that nobody else has a statutory house sales scheme for their housing associations. Um, however, it doesn't mean that RHAs would not be able to operate a voluntary scheme if they wish to. And to support that, we have introduced Clause 8, which will allow um, the department to pay grant in support of uh, a voluntary housing scheme should the housing association seek to introduce one. Uh, the remaining three clauses are the technical ones. They appear in every bill, as you know, interpretation, commencement, and short title. So I wasn't going to go into the detail on those. Um, but that, that's a, a very brief um, run through of, of the, the clauses in the bill. Okay, thank you. Um, is that the presentation finished then? From Yeah? <coughs> okay. Brilliant. Thank you. Minister, is that you finished as well? Yes, yes, please. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to ask a couple of questions and then I'm going to go to the phone lines first and then I'm going to come into the room. Um, I'll just ask them together. The first one, um, I suppose, I, I want to say thank you for bringing it forward, I suppose, first and foremost, and absolutely understand um, the need to have this done sooner rather than later, especially for uh, the co-ownership side of things. Um, but just to ask, Minister, um, it, we, when we talk about accelerated passage, have you got a timeline on that? Um, and that's assuming that the committee agreed to accelerate a passage. And then secondly, it was just to ask, and I don't know whether this is covered in Clause 2 or not, but we know in the past um, intervention has been required, um, especially, to, uh, I know, for example, Woodfield and Victoria Housing, um, where the department had to, to step in. It's just to say, um, to what extent would that be restricted now in, in any of that governance issues and then just also then on the, the, the part about the, um, the uh, right to buy um, scheme, um, that's good to know that the housing associations can, if they wish to, do a, a voluntary um, scheme if they want to, but it's just to ask about the housing executive then on the right to buy. Um, that doesn't cover them, obviously, that the housing executive tenants can still take place um, to do or can still do the right to buy. And it's just to maybe ask um, at what stage are we going to see that amended, um, that the housing executive will be in, uh, in line with housing associations in that. So just for those sort of three questions to begin with. Yeah, thanks very much. And I will call Price will want to come in on some of this, um, Chair, just to kind of... Uh, flesh it out a bit, but I suppose the last one first um, in terms of the housing executive, I mean, there was a decoupling of the issues because obviously taking this ONS classification through and then trying to add the housing executive, they're two completely different issues. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously that would be the same as trying to look at the housing bills more widely in terms of all of the functions contained within it. I want to respond, I suppose, firstly to the urgency of this situation in terms of the reclassification and the impact that that's having on our finances around the housing development programme. Um, the other issue then around the housing executive, I have given intent that I do want to go out and consult on the right to buy scheme um, and what that will look like going forward, but also the importance then of that scheme, for example, was to be ended. What other opportunities then do we give um, to people who want to get on the housing ladder 
what choices can we offer. So um, I'm happy to come back at another stage once we start to develop that out more. Um, so I will be looking at this issue because there is a potential inequality um, in terms of moving ahead with housing associations and not the housing executive. But um, I just met with officials earlier today and obviously uh, we're taking this forward. So as soon as I can get more clarification on the timeline on that, I will bring that back to committee and then obviously that will be uh, part of a full public consultation, um, which will include a quality screening um, and all the rest of it as well. I suppose the reclassification um, and moving through, obviously we still need ONS um, to give approval for this as well. We don't know obviously how long that would take, um, so that's why we're trying to move this through as soon as possible. I am hoping to get this in obviously in advance of the summer recess but I can start to move this through at the other end. And I know Paul can come in with some more specifics in terms of engagement with ONS um, in terms of trying to get this accelerated passage through um, as soon as possible. Um, obviously, we know the derogation is until March of next year. Um, and from our engagements, we know that it's unlikely that they will extend that further. We know that Scotland and Wales have already moved on this. Um, they have had the changes made, obviously, there are, you know, reasons for our delay, and that's because the institutions weren't up and running. Um, so we're trying to move on this as soon as possible to get something introduced um, for the summer recess. But I'll let Paul um, come in on those points, if that's okay. Yes, thank you. Yeah, of course. The, um, 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 can you hear me, by the way? Yep, we can hear you. Oh, good, yeah, sorry. Um, Paul Price, um, BFC. Yes. Um, we believe it's possible to... Um, reach final stage before the summer reset. Um, but it, we're not in control of that. that. That's something we're in the hands of, um, of the Assembly and I think the Assembly Business Office um, in relation to that exactly. Uh, uh, we await, I think, um, timetabling news on that and we'll be able to share it with the committee um, later. We believe it's possible. If it's possible to reach final stage before the summer recess, then that means during the summer recess, the two last things can be done. We can obtain word of assent to the legislation, and then ONS can, prompted by the legislative change, they can review their, March, their September 2016 decision. Um, the other jurisdictions, um, when ONS did uh, look at did this process with them, it took between four and six weeks. So if we apply that time scale to Northern Ireland, um, with a fair wind, as I, as I keep saying, um, you, we might expect that uh, the classification to the private sector had been returned to our RHI by um, September, let's say. It's that sort of time scale we would be optimistic of. Obviously, we are, we'd be very keen on the fastest possible time scale because, as the Minister said, it is £3 million a month. Um, Shane, before I move on to the other point, is that is that enough on timetables? Do you know anything um, further? Yes, yes, it is. The, the the only wrinkle, I suppose, would be how functional ONS is given the current pandemic. Okay. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, on the other um, question, Chair, um, would an inquiry in the manner that um, of the Woodland and Shankill Association be possible? The answer is yes. The, the, um, the changes, as Shane said, um, narrow the grounds upon which the regulation can start an inquiry. Um, but they do so only um, basically um, to where the legislative basis prompts an inquiry. Um, and to be honest, we have never needed grounds wider than that. Um, and so that sort of inquiry would continue to be as possible as it is now. Um, the Minister has mentioned the, um, uh, the intention to bring forward proposals about the housing executive scheme. I wasn't going to answer that. Okay. I was only going to answer that. I was can I just, before you continue, can I just, anybody else that's listening or in on the phones, can you put your phones on mute because in the room there's an awful lot of background noise? Sorry, just if, if members could do that and, sorry, continue with what you were saying, sorry. Um, we did. 
we, um, in our work on this issue over the years, we did look at whether the housing versus sales scheme should also be abolished, i.e. was it necessary in order to achieve reclassification. It was, it was included in a public consultation on that basis. Um, so it was looked at, it was, con it was concluded that it was not necessary. Um, and on that basis, and given the executive's original mandate to us and the need to pass the bill quickly, it was removed. Are you still there? Yeah. Sorry, oh, sorry. I, I, you finished sorry. there. I'm sorry. Finished. The, our, our hearing, our, the, our, um, it's not overly clear here in the room, so uh, it, it's a bit stop and start. Look, thank you for that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go on to the phone. So I am. Um, Carol, can I bring you in first? Yes, please. Um, thank you for the presentation um, from Paul, Jane, and Deirdre. Um, the questions I have really relate to the fact that even though. Paul's last point said the consultation flagged up that there wasn't a need to include the housing executive. I think there'll be a quality implications if you didn't. So the minister has already said that she intends to look at that, so I would encourage you to do that. Um, and also just the figures for the numbers of houses that have been sold. So social housing that's been sold annually and what impact that has on the social housing development programme. And then the last question I have is that um, even even with the, the housing associations being able to retain the voluntary end if they so wish, is that also going to be transferred over to the housing executive? Because if we end the right to buy or end the right to buy sales scheme, then we need to just end it across the board uh, for all. And I would like to see the conditions for any derogation from that. Thank you, Chair. Is anybody going um, to answer shall that? Shall I come in on these questions? On these questions? Um, um, yeah. Uh, uh, sorry, Carol, my, my point about the, um, the housing debt sales scheme in the public consultation was, 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 um, uh, was merely that um, it was a technical point. The, 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 the bill you have reflects our consideration ultimately that in order to achieve reclassification, it was not necessary to remove the housing executive sales scheme. Um, that is no comment at all on whether other things, like social housing supply, for instance, uh, would make it necessary to abolish the housing executive sales scheme. And I, th I think that's the point the Minister's later work wants will address. Um, sales. Um, over the last four years, sales from the Housing Association scheme have ranged between 20 to 60 a year, um, generally going up. Uh, obviously, these sales are market sensitive. Um, in housing executive sales scheme, sales are, are much larger over the last four years between 300 and 400. Um, your, your, I hope I understand correctly the final question about um, a voluntary scheme um, and whether that would also be available to the housing executive. Um, I think it would be it would be a control if we legislated to prevent a housing association operator voluntary scheme. So, so we, we we haven't done that for obvious reasons. It will, however, if, if in the future a minister. Uh, or sorry, excuse me, if, if in law we abolish the housing executive sales scheme, there will be also an option to prohibit in law a voluntary sales scheme for the housing executive or for a minister on policy grounds um, not to approve such a voluntary scheme. I hope that answers the question. Carol, are you happy enough with that? 
No, that, that gives the clarification. But the issue is that despite the growing housing stress, we have a number of homes that are lost and the stocks never replaced. So I'm, I would clearly support this legislation to go forward, even for that reason alone. Okay, thank you, Carol. Um, if you're finished, I'll move on to Robin. Robin, have you any comment you wish to make? Yeah, sure. And I think my my concerns uh, lie a, a wee bit uh, the same as your your own, but particularly around clause seven, clause seven, the abolition of the rights to buy scheme. This is probably one of the most popular things that government did uh, in all the years, and indeed where uh, tenants aspired to be their own. Uh, homeowner, uh, it did indeed uh, contribute significantly to the uh, the area in which tenants bought and invested their own money in, in, in upgrading uh, the properties and so on. Uh, but uh, in saying that, uh, I suppose I do understand some of the uh, the fact that we're taking public housing stock out through the right to buy scheme. But nevertheless, the solution to that wasn't to stop the scheme. It was indeed to build uh, other housing o over the years. And, and we have failed to do that. Can I ask uh, the question specifically, Chair? And the Minister indicated that uh, she would be going out to public consultation. Within the legislation, it indicates that there would be a transition period uh, over a two years uh, time scale. And in terms of that public consultation by the minister and the transition period, can I assume that that would be direct with tenants, that uh, whilst the public consultation may involve the wider public, but indeed that the tenants uh, would also be directly contacted and directly involved in, in the consultation? Okay, thank you, Minister. Yeah, well, there's, um, I suppose, a couple of things there. I mean, I suppose the main issue um, around the right to buy, and it's not to give away options for people who do want to purchase properties, but the challenge we have here is with the provision of social housing stock um, and the impact that that has in terms of a growing housing need. So in terms of the depletion of housing stock, we have seen a big increase in housing need and housing stress. So just when you look at the social housing stress waiting list figures, there has been um, a 42.5% increase from 2009 up until 2019 um, and a huge jump in terms of the housing. And when you look at that in the context of the figures that Paula touched on, where we're losing between 200 and 300 properties um, from the social housing uh, supply, uh, you can see then the problems that we're building um, in the time ahead because those housing uh, stress figures are increasing. They're not decreasing and we need to do something. That said, we also obviously need to provide um, alternatives for people who wish to move to that next phase. And that's why as part of any consultation, we want to look at um, how we can do that, um, present that to the public in terms of that engagement going forward. So we will be doing the wider public engagement, but yes, also listening um, to tenants as well um, will be important also. But I think any, we also have to listen to those on those in housing stress who currently don't have a home, um, and in some cases where families are waiting up to 10 years um, in trying to get a home and they can't access uh, the market itself. So, so we'll be consulting in a serious way um, around all of these issues. And obviously, importantly, a quality screening um, and proofing it as we're going along as well. But I'm happy to come back and discuss these issues, obviously, in more detail with the committee as we're moving through them. Can I, can I just, I mean, Minister, I, I know all about housing stress and housing need. In my constituency, there are 5,000 odd folk who are waiting uh, for a house that's suitable to, to meet their needs. So I understand that. All I am making the case is that we are, we are removing what was the most popular uh, thing government ever did across the UK uh, in giving the tenant a right to buy. 
if we are going to do this, then there are those tenants who do need to be consulted. Face-to-face would be my contention during the transitional period of two years, and indeed that those tenants should be able to consider uh, the future of their tenancy or the potential of them to to purchase uh, during that two-year period. Uh, I think that's only but fair to those who are already in public sector housing. And the answer, obviously, is to the problem is to build more public sector housing over the next few years. I think we already have a question into you on that matter. Can I, I come in here? Um, yeah, go ahead. Cool. Um, I was just going to um, make the point that um, we we considered emphatically that had this bill not included the provisions abolishing the Housing Association sales scheme, then ONS would most definitely not have they would definitely not have reversed the classification decision. Um, the, the, for, for, for government to oblige a housing association to sell its property to a, um, to a tenant, um, to give that tenant the right to buy it, um, was a very, very clear example of a control that would have meant that reclassification would not have been achieved. And that's not to, that's not to say that um, Mr Newton's... Um, points about popularity of that right to buy, not to object to those at all. It's merely that the, 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 the necessity was overwhelming. Um, the, um, um, we believe you can do both. The, the, I think it is possible to support the right to buy of a social tenant, but without, um, take, or without reducing social supply at the same time. And I think that's what this next bill and this next piece of work is going to look at. Um, And yes, indeed, the point of the two years is that someone um, with an expectation of using their right to buy that they have been developing, that it is not abruptly taken away from them. Uh, I hope that helps. Yeah, that helps. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Robin, is that you finished? Yes. That's me finished. Yeah, Charles, well, just really, I, I think the, the Minister has already mentioned the house, Northern Ireland Housing Executive. I think Northern Ireland Housing Executive, um, there is obviously, if this bill goes ahead, there is disparity uh, with the Housing Executive, uh, and um, the, the, there are issues around there that would obviously need to be addressed in the longer term. Yeah, I think that uh, the Minister did speak to that. Um, I'll move on then. Uh, Sinead, have you any questions or comments? Not, not at this time, Chair. Thank you. Grand, thank you. Mark, any questions or comments? Uh, yeah, just I suppose picking up on, on Robin's comment about the popularity of Right to Buy and, and what it undoubtedly has been popular, we have to look at, at where it's got us, particularly in our inability to build. Uh, as many homes as we need or uh, would like to. Uh, Obviously, this has been delayed uh, due to the fact that we didn't have an assembly for three years. I was wondering, could we get a figure on the actual financial cost of that delay in total, what that has been? And and I suppose what is incalculable would be the the, the social uh, cost as well, because we've seen lifts spiral homelessness increase and we're all too aware of the the implications that that has for uh, individuals and families. You made the chair point and it's been echoed by others and it's around the inequity uh, that the, around the right to buy scheme that will be created actually uh, by this bill. I think that is something we have to consider, not just in terms of the inequality but also uh, the practical outworkings, then we already see uh, more than 10 times as many housing executive properties uh, being sold or being bought per year than housing associations. Uh, If now you stop, if people are no longer able to buy housing association homes, will, when it comes to to allocation, uh, people think, no, I won't go there because... I'll never be able to buy it, and you know, will it affect people's choices uh, at that allocation? 
stage, I think that's something that needs to be uh, considered. There will be a suspicion. I would say that the housing executive right to buy being retained or, or, or maintained is about allowing the housing executive to, uh, I suppose, generate the income from those three or 400 house sales a year to keep them running. Uh, and I would echo Robin Newton in terms of uh, the need to, to look properly uh, at where we are going with the housing executive, where the housing executive is going, and how we can empower the housing executive to start uh, borrowing and uh, building again. Because uh, you know, I, I don't know, has there been an analysis done as to why their properties are selling? more given I suppose that they, they are generally older and then I know it's not always the case but often in, uh, due to their age a more or, or a, a less desirable state than some of the newer housing association properties are they also more affordable uh, for tenants to, to purchase uh, I, I think we need some sort of analysis of that as well okay thank you Shall I come in on? on yeah. Um, the, um, uh, the first question, I think, was about uh, uh, how much does it cost us to delay in introducing this legislation? And I think we better, we'd be best um, coming back to that in writing. I, I can give you a fair degree of an answer, though. Um, we've been sheltered from the worst effects this decision would have had, obviously, by the derogation that Treasury has extended to us, but which we must assume is going to end this financial year. Um, but in the meantime, that derogation has meant our development program has been able to add yeah. new social homes to our overall supply uh, unhindered by reclassification. It's been able to add as much as we could afford and there has been no effect. Um, however, we have had to keep co-ownership alive um, what, you know, it, 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 when, it was, when it was classified to the um, public sector, it became ineligible for financial transactions capital. Um, so we've had to keep it alive with our capital that would otherwise have been, could have been spent on new social homes. Um, as each month passes, I think we now go above the total uh, money uh, invested in ownership over the years, probably over 40 million. Uh, we'll confirm that in writing, but if we assume 40 million, um, well, 40 million pounds in housing association grants um, would have built around 600 social homes, would have taken 600 households off the social housing waiting list. And if, if three years ago we had removed the housing association sales scheme at the same time, that would have prevented a further hundred of our existing social homes leaving current supply. So I think the delay has cost us around 700 new social homes, if you want to put it that way. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which is, Thank you for that. Is, and, uh, if you could a significant number, but I think, I think probably that's probably best done in writing, if, if you don't mind. Um, oh, no, okay. no, no, I'd be pleased to get that in writing. That, that would be great. Thank you. Um, on the... Um, on the housing executive and the ability to borrow, I mean, this is, um, I can't say too much. This is a, there's a commitment in new decade, new approach um, on behalf of the executive to, to tackle the housing executive's um, enormous investment challenge. Um, it's something where uh, we've already briefed the committee on, I mean, very briefly. Um, we're in discussions with our minister and, you know, working with our the aim would be to bring forth proposals at some point soon. Um, um, sorry, Minister. No, I think just the add on that. Um, I mean, they're all valid points that are being raised, and obviously there's a wider housing policy and strategy in terms of being developed, which looks at issues like the revitalisation um, of the housing executive, dealing with historic debt, and I know I've talked about this in the chamber and also um, at committee. Um, obviously, I mean, you would love to take all of this together um, in one approach and even in terms of the approach for the housing executive and the right to buy scheme. 
the difficulty though is the time scale around this and that's why I'm bringing this one this part first now because it's the financial implications that if that derogation runs out um, and it's highly unlikely that we're being advised that it would be extended again um, that would have huge financial implications for the the amount of new social homes that we could build over the next couple of years so that's why I mean we would love to encompass everything else into this change in, in the bill. Um, but we have to take this first because any delay in this um, uh, part in terms of the reclassification will have huge impacts on our budget. Um, it would have huge impacts on housing associations' ability to borrow um, and particularly on uh, co-ownership as well in terms of financial transactions. So I know we're bringing, I'm bringing this part in terms of a legislative change but there will be other things that will start to come forward um, in the coming months um, in terms of that wider housing piece uh, that we need to look at as well. So that definitely is in the pipeline. We were doing meetings on it this morning. Uh, obviously, there was a slight delay because of COVID um, and the pandemic, and we'll need to look at that as well going forward in terms of where the construction industry is. Our councils, for example, are going to function in terms of planning permissions and all of that. Um, but, you know, rest assured that, that I am looking at all of these issues seriously. I want to bring forward additional changes um, and protections as soon as possible. And again, I want to engage uh, the committee as I'm moving through all of that. Okay, Mark, anything else that wasn't answered yeah, no, there? No, no, well, I suppose it was remiss of me not to, to I suppose, acknowledge the pressure the department and the minister on there to, to do this quickly and fully understand that and support the action that has been taken uh, to do so. I think it's important we get it through. It's, it's important, obviously, that, that we get it uh, right as well. Now, and I have heard the commitment from the minister around the, the, the wider housing piece, and I'll probably ask for and see <laughs> and get that again uh, in the assembly. You know, I think that is important. Particularly, I know now the last uh, bill that went through accelerated passage, we as committee members, and I think all the parties that are represented on the committee, uh, were very responsible in terms of recognising the risk uh, that might be created by tabling amendments to, to, in terms of slowing down uh, the legislative process or the passage of the bill through the Assembly. I think the same will, will probably uh, apply here. However, I can only speak for my party and, and not for others, and not every party or MLA is around uh, the, the, this committee table. So uh, I, I do think we, we have to, as a committee, the RBS to make sure that this is as robust as possible when it comes before the Assembly uh, to make it kind of, not amendment proof, but tamper uh, proof in a way that it, it, it can't be jeopardised or not go through because we can't afford for it not to be 100% uh, behind the Minister, I suppose, in, in, in any bids or our party will be, that she's making for more money to build uh, more homes, particularly as we emerge from this crisis. Uh, I, I think there's going to be a need for, for huge investment in areas such as social housing, and I think that's why it's doubly important that we get this through now without delay. No, and that, I, I, I absolutely agree with that point, though we do know that the last time in the chamber when amendments were put down, there were plenty of members that voted again, or voted in favour of amendments um, that weren't upheld. But um, I get where you're coming from. Mark, have you any more questions for the Minister? No, no that's fine. Just thank you. Okay. Can I then move on to Fra, if you're there? No. Okay, I'll come back then on that and I'm going back into the room. So Kelly was the first to notify us in the room. Thank you, Chair. Um, can I just take um, the Minister and the officials there back to the actual legislation itself, to Article 2, Part 2, Section 3, or Section C, sorry, um, where it says any guidance issued by the Department under this order relating to housing activities or its financial or other affairs. It's the other affairs part that I'm interested in. Um, what protections will there be for tenants if a housing association is found to be um, acting inappropriately with those tenants? Um, I'm, I'm very aware that this um, section, the inquiries into the affairs of housing associations, is mostly to do with their financial activities. 
Um, but I'm very um, concerned that we haven't looked, or there doesn't seem to be a clear enough um, identification of how tenants can be looked after um, in this um, le legislation. Um, shall I take that one, Paul? Uh, please, Shane, thank you. <laughs> yes, um, the, the, the legislation um, deals with, the, or these changes, um, deal with the existing legislation, the existing 92 order, um, where, where tenants will be protected. Um, it is within the regulatory regime that our regulator operates at the moment. We have uh, three areas that the regulator looks at. So that's um, the uh, corporate governance, um, financial regulation, and the uh, consumer where the tenants are covered and this legislation doesn't change any of the current regulatory framework so they will still be tenants will still be protected by that and i know that when we were going out talking to various um, organizations including uh, tenants groups about the legislation at the same time, the regulator was out discussing with them what they wanted to see within the consumer framework or the consumer end of the framework. So nothing that we're doing here is going to change or lessen the protection that tenants already have. But can I just check with you then, is when you're looking into the inquiries, into the affairs of the activities of a housing association, Without going and protect, without the direct protections to the tenant, what I'm talking about is what are the penalties or the or the issues that will come back on the housing association itself. I'm quite happy that, that the tenants will be looked after, but there must be a way then to then take forward those complaints, those concerns, whatever that issue is, to then have something with the housing association. So what I'm asking for isn't the protection directly for the tenants. It is what is the implication for a housing association if they are found. To if, not be. If, if the, um, the uh, housing association, as a result of an inquiry, is found to be um, in, in breach of, of any of the legislation or any of the guidance that's been issued, then the sanctions that are available are um, set out in the the second and, and sorry, the third and fourth um, uh, elements of, of the bill, whereby you, the regulator can put uh, uh, committee members onto the the board of the housing association to resolve issues um, where there there are issues with the, the housing management or the management of land the regulator can direct that that land or property is transferred to another housing association for them to manage it more effectively. And, and those, those powers currently exist within the 92 legislation. They're just framed more strongly within this uh, to say it, it has to be as a result of an inquiry um, and, and these are the sanctions that can be imposed. I think I just would have preferred to see it spelled out very clearly that that involves um, you know, behaviours against tenants. Um, but just going on then, um, one of the questions I wanted to ask, you'd mentioned it before, that the regulatory elements, um, you're still going to receive the same information. Um, can you just confirm for us that um, how you envisage um, the reclassification would have an impact on any future regulatory framework? And also then looking at, uh, bear with me, sorry, just to call up my notes here. Um, in the past, um, there would have been environmental information regulations. You've indicated there or today that the information would be available afterwards. Will this environmental information be available after the fact or before? I am. Um, I might leave that last question to you. The... Um, um, the previous, your previous question, um, um, Kelly. Um, I think it might help if we, um, if we got for you a, a, an account of how the annual regulatory process looks after the interests of of tenants. Um, 
which is which is um, not covered in any of the materials here today because that is not in the bill, as it, as it were. But actually, that that probably is where your concern is addressed. It might be helpful if we did that in writing as well. It would be um, provided by our, our by the staff in the regulator. But there is, a, there, is, there is, aside from all of the things that Shane mentioned there, the ability to hold an inquiry on various grounds, there is the basic and annual interaction between regulator and housing associations, um, which is, you know, has gears and it can become more intensive if the regulator is concerned um, and can publish critical regulatory assessments of associations on whether they fail to meet the consumer standards the financial standards or the government standards. Would it, would it be helpful to get a bit for you on that? Yes, absolutely it would. Yes. Um, and then I think, I think the, this bill, this bill um, in terms of future, what it would, have, would, would it constrain a future regulatory framework? It would constrain a future regula re regulatory framework from, um, well, it wouldn't actually, it wouldn't do anything, but if we, if we introduced a future regulatory framework that um, added a control um, to those that, uh, you know, whereas otherwise it still removes them, the risk would be that any future review by ONS would create the need for another bill to remove that control, <laughs> if you see what I mean. Yeah, yeah. Um, if, if, if I can maybe come in just with, with a little bit more on that. Uh, when, when we were first uh, working on this, one of the questions we had for ONS concerned regulation, uh, they are content that we have to have a regulatory system given the level of public investment in housing associations. So our, our, they, they, they looked at the regulatory system that we had and the one that we were introducing and they were okay with that. Um, so, so regulation as it stands uh, would not be an issue. One of the things that we will uh, produce for um, people in housing, and we will include the regulation, is, is something akin to the um, rural assessment or a quality assessment, um, so that we have an ONS impact assessment, if you like. So anybody bringing forward changes uh, that that possibly could run foul of ONS, um, we will give them an assessment template to follow and to look at, um, and that hopefully will prevent um, significant controls being added and therefore ONS coming back on their next round of reviews and reclassifying us back again to the public sector. That'd be very helpful. Thank you very much. Um, just my final part, um, Chair, is to say that on the right to buy scheme, um, I noted that um, clauses seven and eight um, would come into effect two years after royal assent for this legislation would be given. So it does give people the opportunity at this stage to purchase within those two years. My concern is during this COVID, or COVID pandemic, um, not too many of our local banks have been willing to um, allow borrowing. My concern would be, is the two-year period going to be long enough to allow those that would consider buying their homes during that period before the legislation takes effect? Is there any discussions with our banks whether or not they will enable people to do that? Because the capacity for borrowing at the moment is quite low. Um, I am very concerned that some may see it also as an opportunity to sell off those older properties that are require high amounts of maintenance to people cheaply in order to get them off their books and what sort of controls will the department have on that? Um, perhaps I, I, can, I can take that. The, the process that we have for house sales at the minute is already limited in that they have to be completed within a particular time frame. Uh, so from start to finish the valuation, for example, that is provided on each property is only valid for six months. So, you know, once as we move through the pandemic, uh, people will still have time, if you like, to, to um, start that process and their valuation on the property would remain valid for six months. Um, the two years will, it isn't about having completed the sale within the two years. It's anybody that has registered an interest 
um, a serious interest to to purchase. So it, it might take a further period of time to complete after the end of the two years. So people still have a, a period of time to to move that forward. Um, the, uh, on the, the the issue of of, of the, the the COVID and, and and the impact on on borrowing, we have not had discussions with the banks on extending that um, at this stage. Okay. Um, may I add just um, the, the the two years? Um, ONS have, have um, you know th there is a risk in that period being longer clearly. So th 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 there is a balance to be struck here that we, you know, I mean, I take the point entirely about COVID. Um, the, the proposal was for two years before the pandemic broke. The, the scope to change that two years involves a degree of risk. I suppose that's all I was going to say that, that, you know, it's again, and the risk is the objective of the bill, the ONS reclassify our housing associations. So that's what the sort of balance we're trying to strike. Okay. Okay, thank you. Moving on. Johnny or Andy, do you anything, Johnny? Yeah, just uh, I suppose most of the points have been comment or have, have been commented on, but I suppose probably just in support of, of what Robin had said, it, it is quite sad to clause seven and, and see the, the abolition of the the right to buy scheme because it, it was, as has already been said, it was an aspirational and positive policy. I felt, and I know many others did, uh, that give people the real chance to actually. Uh, own their own home and hand something on to future generations. So uh, I'm saddened with that, and I, I take point at what has been said by one of the officials. I'm not sure I didn't catch the name, but you know the ability maybe to cater for both. Uh, I would be sceptical about that. Um, I, I look forward to working with the, the department as to how that can be accomplished. Uh, I realise what Kelly has said about two years, but again. That really is only applying to those that are engaged in the process at the minute. It still is taking that away that aspirational right, uh, which I thought was very positive. Uh, but again, it highlights our, our failure to, to keep up with demand in relation to building and so social homes. So it's just a comment from myself. Okay, Andy, do you have anything you want to add further? Yeah, sure. Again, I would just make a comment and, and echo Johnny and Robin's uh, points around the right to buy. And indeed, my party's comments are firmly on the record in respect to where we stood in the right to buy. Um, but we do understand and we appreciate the necessity to have it in the bill in order to achieve the, the overturning of the reclassification. suppose one point I would like to make sure are, is in relation to Clause 8. And just to get more detail on that at a, at a later point, you know, what form that, that grant making process might take. And just to, to make and, and emphasise the point that such a voluntary scheme should not tie um, the hands behind the back and it should be a scheme that which does enable housing associations to fully consider their ability to be able to um, sell those properties to interested tenants. Okay, thank you. Um, any other comments anybody else wishes to make at this stage? Anybody else on the phone want to make further comments? Oh, no. Nice yes, certainly, Carl. First of all, I just got a butter text from Fry sent with apologies, you know, okay. hospital appointment, which I forgot to record. Okay. And secondly, the, the issue is, I just, like, with respect, it's very difficult uh, communicating properly through the forum, but the issue is that you can register your interest within two years and you've still got time. But if the finance isn't available for this scheme, it won't be available for co-ownership. So maybe that's something I keep, need to keep an eye to which isn't within the gift of the minister. All she does is bring forward the barriers in order for people to make their own decisions. But if this doesn't go through, co-ownership doesn't go through either. So I think it's worth saying that. No, and, and absolutely. And I think we all we all know that and we all agree with that. And, and you know, I, I'm with Andy as well on the, the Clause 8. I would be interested to see what that um, the grant is going to look like because we have many people out there and there's an inequalities with the amount of people that are in private rentals and who will never have the opportunity of any um, right to buy because they've never um, had the opportunity to live in a house or in a housing executive or, or um, housing association house. So um, we've, we've, there's a big inequality there also, especially amongst many of our young people who um, wouldn't have the points to get into a housing executive or, or, or a um, a housing association house, and they're left and always left in the position that they 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 don't have an option. Um, so I, I'd be interested to see what the grant is, and I absolutely agree. I mean, the co-ownership 
is, is very much dependent on this getting put through um, uh, as soon as we possibly can. So um, thank you for that, members. If there's nothing further to add, Minister, have you anything further to add? Sorry, sorry, just come off mute, sir. Um, no, again, it is just to say, I mean, it's just to restate, and I know it's been said by a number of members, just the the urgent need for accelerated passage. I mean, I understand that that means you restrict the amount of time to, in terms of scrutinising the bill. Um, but I think, I mean, this has been on the record of doing this from as far back as 2016. Yeah. Um, and it is just that important point of the financial implications and the impact that that will have on our social housing program, but also our co-ownership program as well, and particularly with the derogation ending in March next year. We do need to get this through as soon as possible, notwithstanding um, answering some of the concerns that people have. Um, and hopefully we can follow up on that in writing, and then obviously as it moves to uh, the chamber, um, just to be taken forward. So just again, thanks very much for the opportunity to come forward. I hope people do understand and I think they do the reasons, um, you know, why I need to take this bill urgently and to do so through the accelerated passage process. Okay, thank you, Minister. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Shane, um, for joining us today. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Um, okay, members, I then just want to ask you uh, uh, through the committee, is the committee content then that the bill is granted accelerated passage. First of all, in the room, are members content in the room? Yes. Okay, on the telephone lines, are members content? Great. Great, okay. We're going to move on then, members, to agenda item number six. Just before we go into agenda item number six, um, for us here in the main room, um, it, it, it's quite difficult to hear. Um, so again, can I just remind members, if you're not, if I haven't come to you to ask a question, can you please put your telephones on to mute? Um, it would certainly help us out. And that also goes for, for the, uh, the witnesses that can hear me also. Um, if, we're not, if we're not asking you a specific question or you're not speaking at that time, um, please put your phones on to mute because it is really hard in here. I'm sure anybody watching the live coverage of this at the minute is looking at all of our faces in it here every time there's a funny noise, we're making odd faces. That's what it is, in case you can't hear it out there. Um, so I'm going to move on then to agenda item number six, which is a briefing by Solace NI on the impact of COVID-19 on our local councils. Uh, members, the briefing paper Solace sent us is at page 157 of your briefing packs. And I'd like to welcome the chair of Solace NI, who is David Jackson, to the meeting. David is accompanied by Suzanne Wiley, who is the chief executive of Belfast City Council, Alfie Dallas, who is the lead finance officer of Derry City and Straban District Council, and Ronan Cregan, who is the deputy chief executive and director of finance and resources of Belfast City Council. Um, yes, you're all very welcome. David, if I can hand over to you to uh, brief the committee. Thank you, Chair, and good afternoon. And good afternoon, committee members. Uh, I can report to start with that the sun is cracking the stones on the Causeway Coast this <laughs> afternoon, so just to keep your, your weather theme going. Uh, so thank you very much for the opportunity to address the committee on behalf of the Local Government Senior Officers Group. Um, as you've already said, Chair, uh, I'm going to lead out on the brief uh, and then share uh, our 10 minutes with Suzanne. And we have two of our senior finance officers on the call to help find any technical questions that the committee may have. Uh, we're briefing this afternoon in response to the committee's request for information on the financial impact of COVID-19 on the delivery of council services and to offer our view on what is required to restore councils to their position pre-COVID-19. Uh, within our written submission, you'll also see that we've outlined uh, in response to a request from committee how Solace Northern Ireland endeavours to ensure a consistent approach to the delivery of services across council areas. It goes without say that this is an extremely challenging and unprecedented time. All councils have had their emergency plans activated since mid-March and continue to operate in emergency response mode. Local government continues to play a critical role in delivering essential services, such as waste collection, 
the registration of deaths and cemetery services. There have been many significant changes to how council services are currently being delivered, with a number of services ceased due to uh, ensuring public safety. Staffing levels are also under pressure across council services in order to comply with government guidance around managing the spread of COVID-19. Councils have led a number of response initiatives, including the establishment of coordination hubs through which to distribute the food parcels provided by the Department for Communities and to coordinate frontline support to the most vulnerable and isolated. Council economic development teams are often the first call from stressed businesses seeking advice and support. Throughout, our priority is to ensure that our staff remain safe and healthy so that critical services can continue to be delivered, whilst at the same time minimising any risk to the public engaging with those services. Council staff have been on the front line, keeping open our cemeteries and crematoria, our parks and local amenities, and critically ensuring that waste has been collected and disposed of safely and securely. Council staff are key workers and we all need their work to continue. Turning to the financial impact on councils, committee members will be aware that council expenditure is financed through four key mechanisms. The district rates, external grants, rents from property let, and fees and charges for services provided. Typically, 75% of this income comes from rates compared to 6% for central government. The 25% of income from other sources such as leisure centres, tourist venues, market uh, concert halls and planning fees has almost been wiped out by the COVID-19 pandemic with the exception of grants. <coughs> this equates to an income loss across uh, Northern Ireland local government of approximately 41 million for the period from mid-March till June 2020. This is a headline estimated figure, which obviously needs to be revised in light of recent, recent uh, ability to furlough staff on income generating services and also some of the efficiencies that we're, we're striving to make. Councils are not in a position to compensate for this loss through the use of their reserves alone. This causes four main problems for councils. We can no longer afford to deliver all of the services expected. We are not able to open facilities even when it is safe to do so. We will not have sufficient cash to pay staff and creditors, basically because we will run out of cash, and we will not be able to invest in key recovery programs. This position will significantly worsen if the non-domestic rates relief is not continued after the end of June. This creates a major uncertainty for councils as they cannot financially plan for 75% of their income. The COVID-19 pandemic is likely to have an impact on rates well beyond this financial year. And it is for these reasons that local government would request that government guarantees to council the level of rates income for financial year 2020-21 agreed as part of our rate setting process. These financial issues will significantly erode and potentially eliminate council reserves over the next few months. Even more critical in the short term is the cash flow impact. The financial and income losses will see a number of councils run out of cash to pay staff and suppliers within the next couple of months. And this issue cannot be addressed through borrowing due to restrictions placed on local government in terms of only being able to borrow to fund capital expenditure. An immediate cash injection is therefore required. There will be a knock-on impact on our communities, and stark though the above message has been, the reality is that already deprived and financially stretched communities will lose the one government channel that has consistently been open to them throughout the recent prolonged impasse within the executive. Immediate impacts on communities include uh, potential reductions in waste collection, discontinuance of district council support and coordination of the, the previously mentioned community hubs, secession of financial support to social, voluntary and sporting and community sectors and businesses, attempts to shore up councils 
uh, depleted cash balances by next year having to strike district rates at levels much higher than would normally be acceptable. Uh, one council mentioned to me the potential for a 30% rates increase. Moving from what you've, you've heard recently of large-scale furloughing of staff and some councils uh, figures of around 300 staff being furloughed, uh, moving that to significant staff redundancies, uh, cessation of capital pro programs, uh, reduced investment in the private sector through government-led initiatives such as the, the, the recently and very welcome communicated growth deals, and the discontinuation of community planning. I'm now going to hand over to Suzanne, who will briefly discuss how to remedy the financial crisis faced by councils. Okay. Um, good afternoon, members, and thank you very much, David. Um, I'm thinking you can hear me okay? Yep, go ahead, Suzanne. Yeah, good. Okay. So I'm going to cover um, the financial support um, that we feel is needed. Um, to ensure that councils, councils are sustainable going forward and that we can also play our part in recovery. Um, so, first of all, um, we would ask the committee um, just to note that we're not the only um, uh, local government organisations in this dire financial um, position um, and that um, local government financial support bids have been given in principle approval in other devolved regions, Scotland and Wales, on the basis of the consequential impacts um, that David has talked about, and primarily to keep those councils open and to preserve roles like economic recovery. Um, and you should also note um, that an initial bid in respect of reduced income for the first three month period has been submitted um, by um, DFC to be discussed by the executive, and we believe that that will happen in the very near future. I'd also like to stress that Solis is really grateful to the Minister and her department for the interventions that um, they have already made, and that is the development of the Scheme for Emergency Financial Assistance for COVID-related response work, um, although we have asked for some expansion of that, particularly in respect of costs associated with additional community support roles and also PPE. And we're also grateful um, that um, the Minister did make representation for local government in terms of encouraging and clarifying the furloughing facility for income supported local government staff. Um, however, um, given all that above, um, uh, we also have um, significant uh, loss of income that you've heard David talking about, and we are currently facing uh, a substantial risk to rates income uh, as well, and you can see the impact that that is likely to have on communities. So the 11 councils are urgently requesting the following support um, and assurances. So firstly, um, in relation to lost income and cash flows, we're asking that lost income caused directly by the pandemic will be mitigated by a specific COVID-19 financial support package, and that would need to be sustained throughout the crisis period because we would ask um, the committee to note that in respect of the recovery plan that the executive launched yesterday, it's likely to be step five um, before councils will be able to open the majority of their revenue generating activities as they're mostly related to tourism and conference and public gatherings, etc. Um, and it should also be noted that the final figures on these fee-based fee income losses will depend on the level of drawdown from the job retention scheme that will ultimately be agreed um, by HMRC and also the length of time that that scheme will apply for. Um, however, even if this guarantee of underwriting lost income is forthcoming, councils are still likely to suffer from some cash flow problems in terms of paying staff and suppliers. Therefore, in addition to the COVID-19 lost income support package I've just mentioned, um, councils would also like support from the Committee and Department of Communities to work um, alongside the Department of Finance to find a mechanism um, such as access to interest-free loans that will help us to manage our cash flow on a month-to-month -month basis so we can pay our staff and suppliers. So that's the first element um, in relation to lost income and cash flows. Secondly, in relation to losses um, and the risk to our rates income, which as David says makes up 75% of council income, members will be aware that council set their budgets on what is known as the estimated penny product set by land and property services. It's vital, therefore, that the amount of rates income estimated is guaranteed 
Um, otherwise, councils will meet large clawback bills from LPS at the end of the year, which we're unlikely to be able to pay. Um, therefore, it's critical that consideration is given to an extension of the non-domestic rates relief scheme beyond June, and that will also support businesses, but also that there is a guarantee that rates the rates-related proportion of council income will not be allowed to fall below that estimated figure that was agreed at the start of, 20, of um, 2020 um, and uh, 2021. Um, it would also help um, to consider the possibility of applying rates relief to council premises, um, which are not eligible at the minute, or at least a deferral of those payments, which would assist us with cash flows. So the time frame for rates guarantee is really, really critical as it doesn't just need to apply to this financial year, but will also need to apply going forward into the next number of financial years because if councils are going to be sustainable and they're going to support business and community recovery, they will need to have a solid financial basis on which they can plan. So it's vital, therefore, that LPS work with councils to develop a robust rates forecasting model. Um, so that we can assess the impact that the steep downturn will have on rates income in future years. But it's also vital that a mechanism is agreed in which a guarantee can be given to councils that the rates-related proportion of their income does not fall below the estimated figure set this year for the next two financial years. And, the, and um, in saying that, the committee may well wish to note that in England, councils are submitting bids to Treasury for a three-year financial package from next year. So thirdly and finally, what I would li like to um, put in front of the committee is that local government also um, want to participate in um, a strategic dialogue with the executive and their departments on the unique role that councils can play and want to play in recovery. And we would also therefore propose urgent joint work on co-designing two things, support for opening up our local economies and our towns and cities safely and producti productively and a package of further measures to support local businesses um, and communities that would flow through local government. So just finally, in conclusion, councils um, here do require these vital interventions to avoid uh, a cliff edge in um, financial crisis developing, and for some that will be in the very near future. And as David said, council workers have been at the front line and have contributed greatly to the safety and well-being of our communities. So it's important that we avoid undermining these critical services. We don't have any other choice but to look to central government to help um, provide the necessary stability required to give all councils the confidence to maintain critical services and um, prevent substantial rates hikes in future and also to plan for this positive recovery. So we therefore ask the committee to support these requests. Um, and finally, I would say that obviously finance and local government finances are a very technical issue. So I know Ronan and Alfie are well poised there to take any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you. Um, David, do you have anything else to say or is that the, the, the brief finished? That's us finished, Chair. Suzanne okay. concluded perfectly. Okay, look, can I just start by thanking you um, for sending us your, your brief and also be for, for being really frank and honest because that's what we, we were relying on you being and that's what we were asking for. I mean, many of us um, elected representatives were councillors. I was a councillor for six years and when you mentioned Penny Product, it was like a throwback, um, having to sit through uh, setting, striking of the rate and the Penny Product. Um, so I, I, I really am, I ha, I, I, you know, I, I have an interest there as well because it's something, it's how I started my political career. I also want to thank you. I, I, I know in, in my own, I'm, I'm North Belfast is covered by Belfast and Antrim and Newton Abbey. And the work that our councils have done over the COVID response has been fantastic. Um, and I know that the amount of pressure that each of those, or the, each, all chief executives across the board have been on and are on, under in recent weeks. So I just want to put it on record to say a massive thank you. Um, anything that you have been asked to do, you have picked the ball up and you've went ahead and you've done it. So thank you for that, first and foremost. Um, so I just want to ask a few questions before I bring members in. Um, and um, I understand, again, again, your, your frankness and your honesty has been great. And I'd like you to be frank and honest when we continue the, the deliberations here as well. Um, I, I just want to ask the question around, we know that some councils 
um, really only have a matter of maybe 10, 12 weeks before they will be in very, you know, a very bad per, uh, financial position um, if funds are not forthcoming. Um, what is the process there to do with responsibility and collective responsibility under the fiscal powers of council? Um, yeah, and 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 what way is that going? To, would you see that progressing? And then another question I had wanted to ask um, was: Have you got a figure in mind, even a ballpark figure? of what is going to be required um, even within the next, if we even take the next three months um, of the amount of money that is going to be required for uh, collectively for all councils that the executive um, would need to be considering. David. Thank you, Chair. Um, if you're, I'll, I'll reverse the order on, on my responses uh, because I have a, a figure in my head because there's been quite detailed discussions with the department and on the basis of, of some of the support that, that we believe is coming in relation to the furloughing and, and members will understand that we can't furlough uh, all of those, uh, all of our employees, um, it's, it's only those that are in the income generating uh, parts of our service provision. Uh, but the, the headline figure we believe is, is in around 24 million. Uh, so the initial estimate of 41 million was the the income losses uh, in total. Uh, since then, some councils, there was uh, council recently furloughed 300 staff, uh, and obviously that that's going to help manage their 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 short-term financial position. Uh, and there's also the scheme of emergency financial assistance will help us cover some of the additional costs that we've incurred in, in our response mode. Um, I'll maybe just uh, ask Alfie to come in to see if he's got any sort of further detail because he is actually, as our lead finance officer, has had that conversation with uh, departmental officials. Yeah, um, thank you. Just um, to build on what David has been saying, that the £40 million is £10 million pounds a month. And I think what we've presented initially is the first three, four months of the financial year. So it's very clear that that ask will continue beyond because um, I think it's going to be a long time before our leisure services, for example, are, are back to the, the level of budgets that we would previously have been setting for them. So that £10 million per month is to replace those financial losses that we're currently um, incurring. And most of it does relate to the, the service income that we've lost from leisure off-street car parking, planning and building control. Um, I think it is really important to point out that that does not include the impact on the rate base. Um, we'll be aware that up until the end of June that has effectively been guaranteed and Suzanne mentioned about how important it is beyond that point um, to give councils clarity that that relief um, is continued and that our rates income is based on our estimated penny product for the year. So the headline figures are 10 million per month. Um, that will continue for an uncertain period of time, plus also the rate base impact. And it's really important the engagement with land and property services to try and model what that may, may look like. Chair, just uh, r responding to your first uh, question, uh, each council will be presently working up its own financial recovery plan. Uh, at, at this juncture, uh, all we can do is, is operate on a worst case scenario. So it will be a, a rolling scale of measures, uh, which I suppose ultimately translate into reduction of services or closing of services uh, to, to, to basically address the deficit. And what you will end up with is, is, is only essential services or perhaps even a, a reduction in, in essential services. And there's obviously a, a, a very tight time frame on this. Um, the, the, the estimates I have heard from some councils in terms of when this really bites, uh, we're looking at the summer months, probably probably around August time, uh, in a world of, of no assistance, uh, where councils will either uh, move into a technical insolvency or uh, will have to take uh, quite severe measures in order to, uh, to just maintain all but the, the most essential of the, of the service provision. 
Chair, if I could ask Ronan as well to come in just um, in relation to the um, activities that councils are currently undertaking to reduce their expenditure, um, because we know that this burden um, has to be borne by us as well as central government, and also the process um, in terms of uh, if we do um, uh, go uh, dip well into our rates um, and can no longer pay staff. So, Ronan. Uh, right. Thanks, Suzanne. Uh, we, I mean, at the minute, what we're trying to do is to do a forecast at the year end in terms of um, what the income is likely to be. So we've roughly about 23 income types um, that local authorities can get money from. Um, so we're going down every one of those lines, um, budget by budget, and at the same time, we're reviewing all our expenditure budgets to identify where potential savings can come from. But for most councils, um, about 60 percent of their budget is staffing costs, so it is quite limited in terms of the short-term savings that you can actually make. In terms of the actual process, it's actually quite complicated when getting legal advice on it because the section 114 in the Local Government Act 1988 applies in England and Wales, so it, but it doesn't apply here. So we're actually trying to find um, legal advice what happens if a council becomes insolvent. The only thing we can find at the minute is that the department um, could step in to do an inspection, but that's all we can find. And, and just on that point, um, is that, was that Ronan? Yes, wasn't it Ronan that yeah. just finished out, Ronan? Just on that point, um, is there that, I know um, we've heard about uh, a council over in England, was it council at Windsor or something that had gone into liquidation and there was talk about surcharges on councillors and things like that. Is, is that something that could be replicated here if that was to happen? Um, no, I don't want to frighten our councillors now making decisions about being surcharged. So, yeah. um, no, the legislation here is different than in England and Wales. Yeah. So there's a section called Section 114, and there's a whole process that you go through if local authorities can agree a financial position. But we don't, we don't have that here. Okay. So we're trying to work out exactly what would happen if the council like, basically runs, runs out of money. And, and I know with, with various councils, it will not maybe be all councils, but amongst certain many of the councils, a lot of the, the services that we provide, and when it does come to the stage where um, various things can open up again, they are subsidised by the rate pair as well. They're not money-making. Um, so that is going to pose a problem, I suppose, going forward also um, that of, of certain services. I just want to, just before I bring in, I'm going to go to the room first, um, just to do with the impact on communities. Um, I, I know that it's not, all, it's not even just all financial input from councils, but there's that capacity building and advice um, that communities very much rely on. And they've had such a great relationship over, over the years, but especially over the last few weeks where the council and, and, and various people and communities have been working together um, it just would be it would be uh, as a result of all of this it would be rather shameful if you know that those communities were to be impacted in, in you know greatly um, because of the, the lack of income um, so I, I just want to suppose to ask have, have you seen that starting to play out yet or when do you envisage um, that's going to have that knock-on effect within the communities? Will I come in there, David? Go ahead, Suzanne. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the demands from communities um, have been growing and growing, and you can see that um, in the example of, for example, the food package deliveries that councils are doing in conjunction with the Department for Communities, um, and that we cannot currently meet the level of demand. That is going to continue, I'm sure, and it's even going to continue post post the crisis um, as we um, go into you know, economic um, recession, etc. So yes, that demand will be there. It will grow, I would say. Um, and of course, councils um, are adding some of their own financial support um, to community organisations to help support communities as well. So as money starts to run out, that support will, um, from councils uh, will start to, to disappear. Um, and I would say that um, there will be, um, you know, communities um, clearly do need that level of very local support where there's an understanding at local level of who the community organisations are and where the actual need is across communities and local government is best placed to, to see that and coordinate that. 
Okay. Uh, I, mean, I, I do absolutely agree with you, Suzanne, going forward. I think that the much tougher times are ahead. They haven't necessarily been during the, this past sort of seven weeks, I think, um, going forward, especially amongst those communities um, that are that are so reliant on, on our local councils, um, things are going to get so much tougher. And we need to protect those people. You know, some of those are the most vulnerable people within our communities and disadvantaged communities. Um, so I, I absolutely get that. Um, and thank you. Um, I'm going to just now open up a few more questions I can come back on, but I'm going to open it up to the room first. So I have Johnny has indicated first and then Kelly. Okay. Thank you, David, and thank you, Susanna. We appreciate the presentation, and I suppose I want to firstly be associated with the Chair's remarks as to thanking uh, local councils for the work that they've done throughout the period of COVID-19. Um, both councillors, officers and chief executives are operating in a very difficult environment. We understand that, uh, and, and we, we just want to put on, on record our appreciation for all that has been done. I know with my own local council and ABC, the contact with chief executive Roger Wilson and councillors has, has been good, and I, I welcome that because I think uh, one thing that COVID-19 has clearly shown is the need for joint up government across both uh, regional and local government and national uh, in order to deal with this in an adequate way. While, while I'm supportive <coughs> of the Council's position and I'm sympathetic to a financial package, uh, I suppose probably further scrutiny will be needed around the, the ballpark figure, etc. But this may require further paper, so if you can answer now, that, that's, that's fine. But it's, it's to go into maybe a wee bit of detail, and you did mention it, uh, um, Suzanne had mentioned it, in relation to some of the savings that Council, we, we've heard and we see in the paper cl very clearly where the losses have come from, but it, within the paper itself, it, it does not indicate where the potential savings have been for Council during COVID-19, and we know that can be from whether it's fuel or whether that's... Uh, uh, energy costs, etc. And I, I suppose probably what I would like to say, and to, for me to be able to justify the, the ballpark figures, is what have those savings been? Uh, how has different councils operated in relation to those savings? So that's something that maybe requires a wee bit more work, but I'm sure that each individual council has that information. Uh, and another question would be in relation to the support that is there at present. So the announcement, and I know that was welcome in relation to the furloughing of staff. Um, do we have an indication of how many council staff have been furloughed across Northern Ireland and maybe even broken down per council area? And is that furloughing at 80% or has, is the council uh, making up the, the additional 200? Because obviously we need to look at steps to ensure that it is sustainable in the long term, uh, given the financial pressures that you face. Um, my final sort of question would be in relation to, obviously there's certain flexibilities within the Local Government Act, uh, and particularly around financing, and ha has Council looked at uh, and explored with the Department, and particularly maybe even the Department of Finance, uh, other methods uh, in relation to financial flexibility, whether that's reprofiling loans, uh, capitalisation of, of some reserves, um, that type of, uh, of work, is that ongoing or ha has that conversation be ha been had? And finally, if you remember them all, is in relation to um, your engagement now with business, because obviously 75% of your income is, as it has been indicated, is rates revenue. Now, while we understand the, the immediate impact right now and subsequently straight after, uh, as things start to come back to some form of new normality and we see the roadmap in place, uh, we're, we're going to see activity on our high street again, and we're going to see businesses opening up again. What steps have Council now put in place to help those businesses to see them through to the next stage? Because obviously that's going to be key, and it's going to have a, a major impact in relation to your forecasts for next year. So if you need any supplementary comments as to what questions, please come back to me. Uh, thank you. Um I'll pick up the, uh, the second and third points. I'll maybe ask uh, Ronan to come in on the, the first uh, question, and then Suzanne can come in on, on the business engagement. But in relation to the, the furloughing of staff, uh, those are, are live decisions which, uh, which councils have been going through uh, for the past week. Uh, the, 
our ability to furlough staff was communicated at the start of May. I think it may have been the 1st of May and, and confirmed on the, the 4th of May. So as a result of that, uh, those decisions are being taken through the, the various council chambers. I had my first remote council meeting last night and, uh, and, and, and those decisions were, were taken by elected members. Um, I think I mentioned earlier that the, uh, the scale of, of the furloughing, uh, one council, it's been reported in the media, uh, had, uh, has furloughed uh, uh, something of the order of 300 staff. Um, but obviously those being uh, human resource uh, sensitive uh, and staffing issues, uh, some of the decisions are not yet made and some of them are not yet in, in the public domain. So I'm not shying away from, from answering the question. I think we'll have a full picture uh, within about 10 days once all of, those, uh, all of those decisions have been brought to the respective councils. Um, in relation to the third question on you know, the, the flexibility in terms of our, our financial uh, options available, uh, those are being explored at council level. And we are also having conversations with the uh, uh, Department for Communities as our lead department and also with the Department for Finance. So, so we're, no, we're exploring all options and, and in every way looking for the maximum flexibility. And in fact, uh, as far back as early April, uh, we, we put that on record in, in communication with, uh, with officials in the Department for Finance. Um, the, the two uh, finance officers may wish to develop that, that, that third question uh, a little bit further, but if I just go to Ronan uh, in terms of uh, he can offer a view. I can give you a high level view of what's happening in this council, but uh, he can perhaps just uh, articulate uh, how some of the savings are being identified and quantified, uh, which of course will go, go part way to offset the, the, some of the cash challenges. Okay. Just before you do, David, uh, on the, for, uh, the furloughing question, uh, I understand some of them are commercially sensitive in relation to, and councils are ongoing. Uh, have you an indication at this stage how many councils have furloughed staff as we speak? Uh, to the best of my knowledge, at the moment, I think four of the 11, uh, but that's only through, uh, through conversations I've had. I, it's actually... Uh, we have a call to discuss it at four o'clock this afternoon, and we should have, I'll be updating uh, my council's position uh, this afternoon, having been through uh, the decision-making process last night. But I, I, to the best of my knowledge, it's four, four out of 11 so far. But David, just to say that all of them will furlough staff. Um, I think they're all going through the process of identifying the staff, informing the staff at this point in time as well, um, and making um, those decisions in the next um, few days. Uh, so they will all furlough some staff, and we will get you the, the numbers. And also, there's a difference of, of opinion at the minute um, on uh, topping up. Um, I think the vast majority of councils will top up to 100%, but that will all depend on the financial ability of the council, the individual councils, to do that. So, and I appreciate that. Thank you, Suzanne, for that update. Um, and I would, I would expect all councils to probably access the furloughing scheme. I, I, I would have thought that maybe would have happened already, uh, given the urgent pressures there is. Uh, I suppose probably, you know, you're, you're indicating here that all councils will pretend, will probably top up to 100 percent and that does cause some concern in relation to uh, financial flexibility and ongoing concerns regarding mm -hmm. um, the council budgets which you presented to us here yeah. today and, and, the, and the concerns so I would have some concern about that uh, but if you if you want to carry on I would just move on to the savings question in relation to ballpark savings that have happened across the councils yeah so I mean you have to understand, in terms of on the saving side, the difference between um, a budgetary saving and an actual saving. So what we were doing is the rate set against the bu budget, which is not the actual. So we are doing a forensic review of basically every budget line, um, expenditure line um, in the council. So And we have identified savings as a very simple example will be is where we give events grants out. Um, for this year, we have held that money back. Um, and, re and realigned it because the events won't be happening this um, this summer. We are um, there will be savings and premises savings, but not as much as we would hope. Things like leisure centres, you can't just turn um, the heating off the pool. The walls um, of the pool collapse if they go straight to cold. So you still have a significant amount of premises cost. There will be some transport costs, 
and some supplier um, cost savings as well. But you also have to balance that against um, the PPN notice about um, providing um, paying suppliers, even though they're not providing the service, in order to keep them um, afloat. So every council is doing that line by line um, review, and basically that has to be reviewed every month. So, but I have to caution that I mean, when 25% of your income um, is basically being wiped out, then it is there is no possibility that you can match on um, that loss. Um, against your expenditure savings, no, and, and I, it's, I suppose it's I, not possible. I, I appreciate that, and I, I know that it's quite a difficult task. And I know that actually individual councils have have went quite into considerable detail regarding potential savings and how to to best manage what is a difficult situation. So, if it is possible for the committee's deliberations, I know I know I personally would appreciate a further paper from from Solace maybe breaking down per council in relation to those uh, potential savings that could be made on that point. I don't think that's a problem at all, and we're more that we want to be as open book about all of this as we possibly can. Um, so we'll make sure that that information is provided to you. And just the last one, Suzanne, was with you with regards to business support. That's yeah. Um, so of course we're really concerned about the rate base going forward because in a financial downturn such as um, we're in and, and going into further, but there will be loss of business, um, and of course when um, uh, a, a lot. A lot of councils um, will be primarily supported through their um, the non-domestic uh, element of their rate as well. So that will have a big impact. Getting them up and running again um, also will have a financial cost associated with it as well. And yes, we have been working with our lo local business um, organisations um, like Chambers of Trade, um, etc., to look at what their particular concerns and issues are and how we're going to open up not only individual businesses and give them the advice that they need about social distancing, um, but also places themselves. So if you think about towns and city centres um, and the agglomeration of businesses that are there and a, and a lot of the, the food and beverage, um, hospitality sector, etc., who are asking, can we spill out into the streets, for example? Can you put up canopies? Can you realign the roads um, for us to do that? What about queuing um, going forward? Are you going to organise that? Retailers are asking us, will you help us um, with sharing logistics and giving us platforms for promoting um, you know, our uh, products, etc., um, and really ramping all of that up. And of course, the tourism sector is going to be um, significantly affected for a considerable period of time, and that's going to have a knock-on effect on a lot of our town and city centre um, businesses as well. So the answer is yes, we are working um, very actively w with um, all of those business organisations. Um, we will... Um, uh, that will obviously have a cost associated with it, as I said, um, and there will obviously be an impact on the rate um, base for the next few years, um, which we have, in terms of what I presented earlier, we will need to work with government to see how we can uh, supplement that loss to local government so that it can actually work on recovery and maintain its critical services over the next number of years. I know we, we as MLAs, and I don't speak for myself here, that you know businesses have been very proactive and looking for creative ways in which they can mm. potentially uh, have a, a soft start, as, as so to speak, in relation to, to getting things going. And councils are going to be crucial in, in helping those businesses through this because it's an information minefield at the minute. For many of them, and, and again, I, I think that councils are going to be crucial in delivering that message directly to business. I, I see recently that the executive did announce an extra hundred million for the city deal. Um, is there a potential with that uh, to be used in relation to the the business restart post uh, a COVID reopening? So, in terms of that hundred million, um, it is capital money, um, so it has to be spent on capital projects. Um, and uh, not revenue. Uh, now, that's not to say that we can't support business, and certainly we've been looking at a number of um, potential bids um, already um, for that money. Um, so, for example, um, 
uh, digitization um, of um, business and also um, communities as well to help them uh, with digital capacity um, and online capacity, um, where that can be um, a capital um, project. And we're also looking at um, climate change um, projects as well, and how we can stimulate the economy um, through um, climate projects too and green projects. So it's very early days, obviously that was only announced a couple of weeks ago, um, but the city deal consortiums um, and boards are actively looking at all of those issues and certainly will be engaging with business and communities about what uh, that money could best be used for and also that it could be spent um, in the earlier years of city deal, because you know city deal is a, is a 10 year programme. Okay, thank you, Kelly. Chair, thank you. Um, could I just add one point, this yes, is Alfie here. Um, I know the issue around reprofiling of loans and capitalisation um, was raised. So in terms of reprofiling of loans, um, most of our loans are with the Public Works Loan Board and we haven't been able as councils to um, refinance those up to now. Um, so in relation to capitalisation, um, we're obviously having those conversations with the department as an option, but ultimately any costs that we capitalise, any revenue costs, will have to be ultimately borne by ratepayers next year and the year after at a time when the rate base is under um, very significant strain. Um, just in terms of, um, I know councils are working through the numbers in terms of, of, of furlough. Um, I know from the overall £10 million, um, per month financial impact, I know the aim of furlough is to try and recoup about two million to three million of that. That's uncertain because our claims will be subject to scrutiny to HMRC, but I suppose that just gives some indication of the level of target that we're trying to save through that. And obviously we'll be trying to build on that further through eliminating discretionary spend and things like that. Thank you. Okay, and I think that is whenever we do look at the savings, I think um, by that stage, um, we will, all councils will have decided what their furlough, uh, amount of furlough is going to be. So that will be seen as a saving. That's not new money coming into you. All that is is a saving. Um, so I think it's good that we that, that doesn't get muddied either, that this is seen as new money because it certainly isn't new money. Um, so it, it's more, more of a saving to the councils rather than money being received by the councils. Um, I'm going to bring in Kelly now. Thank you very much. Um, and just to reiterate what the Chair has said earlier, please do pass on our thanks. It's for yourself and for all of your staff. Um, being on the front line is not easy for anyone, um, and, and your staff have certainly um, proved themselves to go above and beyond. And a huge um, thanks for the food parcels that have gone out. Um, I know in my own community it has been very much appreciated by those people who have been shielding and who are very vulnerable. Um, Suzanne, earlier you talked about um, wanting to have an open book. One of the concerns that I have, just coming from the business background, that I have is reserves. Um, I'm very concerned at what councils would, if they were just a normal business, be seen now as um, basically on the verge of bankruptcy and which councils uh, maybe are healthier. Um, so what I would like to find out, perhaps if you're providing a future paper, would be to give us a breakdown um, as to those councils that now are running with zero reserves, because that will have an implication for your operations moving forward in the future, because you'll have to build that up again. Is it a case that those reserves, it's just the operational reserve that has been now eaten into, or are there any other things that are going to hit us in the future? Um, I'm sure pension pots and so on are fine, but um, known liabilities such as redundancy payments and so on, is that all safe? Um, I'm sure Alfie and Ronan, you'll be able to answer me on that. The other thing that I wanted to um, ask you about is the upfront expenditure that you've mentioned in your support requested. Um, obviously, the Department for Communities will decide um, if those upfront expenditures that has been incurred, what would be approved and what wouldn't be approved, because I know that some councils have been a bit more innovative in using money um, to help out with during this coronavirus, and others maybe have been a bit more cautious. So it's just to understand what those what that upfront expenditure has been. And um, the final one I wanted to ask is, obviously there is, you've mentioned as well in your support requested about the LPS to work with councils. Is this something that, that you really want to go down that line of if you, if you open that case because my 
when I read that, I sort of see, okay, a forecasting model is one thing, but is this where LPS may come forward and actually take the democratic decision out of councils by saying that there needs to be, say, for instance, a 2% increase over a period of five years? Because we know that councillors and councils have been trying over the last number of years to keep um, rates as low as possible, um, when in actual fact, perhaps a little bit more, more robust saving into reserves could have seen some through. So I'm just wondering... That LPS pace that you're talking about, um, the forecasting model is one thing, but is this with an intention to get um, them to have input to the rate setting process? Okay, um, David, I think probably um, I would ask Ronan to come in and Alfie on the reserve issue. Um, first of all, because obviously they've been doing the in-depth work around um, all of the, the councils. Um, and uh, and then we can come back on the other questions. Yeah, yeah Alfie can come in maybe on, because he's been quite intimate to the scheme of emergency financial assistance on, on the, yeah. the second question. And Ronan's uh, sort of been more intimate to the LPS piece. So, uh, okay. Ronan, are you happy to, to lead on the, yeah. the, the reserves question? No, Alfie's going to lead on the reserves. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, so in terms of the reserves um, impact, obviously each council is very different, um, as, you, uh, as you've highlighted. Um, we're um, absolutely able to bring back a further paper in terms of the detail um, on, on that. Um, you know, I can only comment in terms of uh, part of the collection analysis that we've done to, um, I suppose, demonstrate the general impact showed a general message that six months was the average across Northern Ireland. Um, of the point that which reserves would run out, although some councils will obviously be quicker than that and some will be um, slightly more than that, but we're happy to provide further information in relation to each specific council impact. I know in terms of our council, six months is were typical, that, that that would be the time when we would start to um, run out of reserves. Um, just picking up on a couple of the other points, um, the pension pot is obviously safe. I would just point out that that's likely to be a pressure going into next year's rates um, because um, obviously the impact of the pandemic on, on markets is going to significantly impact the, the, the assets value. So likely we will have additional pressures going into next year's rates um, in relation to um, pensions. In relation to the upfront expenditure, um, I, I spoke earlier about 10 million being the total um, overall cost. Um, about 1 million of that um, per month across the councils relates to um, new types of cost that we're incurring in the interim to respond um, to that pandemic. Um, I think what we're finding is certainly only a small element of those costs um, are covered by the, the, the CECA scheme. So, for example, things like protective equipment and that um, at this moment in time aren't um, covered by the scheme. Um, so uh, I'll pass over to Ronan in relation to the land and property services engagement. In, in terms of land and property services, under the Local Government Finance Act, it's totally... Um, in the jurisdiction of each council to set the rate. So land and property services cannot um, have any decision making powers in terms of what level um, the district rate is set up. But in terms of the forecasting, I mean, when 75% of your income is from one income source, it is really important to understand that source. So um, typically, um, under the old or the current ATP system, where we would get notifications in terms of what the, your actual rate is going to be, it is a very high-level analysis. But moving forward, we need to understand what level of losses that they're going to have, what is the potential um, in terms of each sector around vacancies, what type of debt, um, particularly debt that's going to be written off, what's that likely to be, are there going to be an increase in exclusions, and um, also in terms of APP growth. Um, any growth that we would have been forecasting was likely not to happen next year as um, new buildings are stalled and don't come online. So it is really important. Um, LPS holds the data uh, in terms of the rate base. So we want to work with them in terms of the data and we will probably be in Belfast commissioning detailed analysis um, from a few digital companies to have time to um, accurate forecast for 21, 22 and beyond. Final, sorry, one final question just to, to finish off, Chair. Um, 
Um, we will be talking later today, and we have talked about it before, the support for councils to enable councillors and council meetings to take place. Um, that surely will be a cost um, to councils to roll out the ability for um, digital communications, video conferencing and so on. Um, has that been built into your £10 million? And is the, can you confirm how many councils are currently um, trying to enable that? Or is there anybody not using video conferencing? Because the new normal would suggest that this might be something that we'll be dealing with in the future. Uh, I can just come in on that and say that well, we used uh, Microsoft Teams for the first time for a, a virtual uh, video conference last night. Uh, we did have to upscale our, uh, our uh, digital capability in order for all 40 councillors to be able to use that. Um, my understanding, and I will just have to, we, we did build it into our bid, but uh, I have a feeling that was rejected. Um, the IT costs were rejected, um, but I'll just run that past Alpha uh, for uh, surety on that. And just to also say, uh, certainly the majority of councils are moving towards that, that arrangement. I think we were the third or the fourth uh, decision-making forum that has taken place since the legislation came through at the start of May, uh, allowing us to do that. Uh, and most of the councils are moving that, that direction. Uh, w there are uh, clearly further benefits. Uh, the feedback from, uh, from the councillors last night was quite positive. And I think that given the, the, in our area the, the geographic spread, we'll certainly be looking to use that for future subcommittees, working groups, uh, much more time efficient, saves on travel costs, and really does work perfectly well. So uh, in, this, in this new world, there are some, uh, some opportunities coming out of the, the serious challenges that we've faced over the last five or six weeks. But I might need to just ask Alfie, I have a feeling that certainly the IT costs were uh, were rejected from the CIFA bid? Yep, um, I can just confirm, David, that the costs, those types of costs were included in our forecast and um, we have not been able to secure funding for those yet through the CIFA scheme. Okay, thank you. That's, that's quite good for us to know because it's something that we can certainly, um, if, if the communities are taking forward legislation to enable digital communications, um, well, we might ask them where the money's coming from. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Andy, have you any comments? No? No, this not time? Much, no. Okay. Carol, can I go to you then? Um, there's, there's very large. Thank you, everybody, for the presentation. And again, just to repeat um, the statements from all um, the MLAs at the committee that you are all doing a very, very good job in very difficult circumstances. Um, I mean, this, this is a presentation, and obviously it's also an ask. So there's a, a lot of details there, but there's also a lot of details needed. Um, the concern that I would have is that we're going to ask to support additional money while staff will be um, let off. So that's a big concern. Um, and given the fact that certainly the shape of things have changed, uh, I'm still not content um, with what I've heard regarding that. The other thing is... Um, in relation to the issues about rates and LPS and that, we need to see a lot more detail because what we don't want is the, the rates that ordinary citizens have been, uh, been basically hit with massive rate bills um, for a pandemic, effectively. Um, so obviously there's a, a need for that, and I understand the figures that have been presented in terms of 10 million a month. Um, but there's also governance issues with some councils. I'm not going to name many of them here. Um, and I'd like to see almost a clean bill of health coming from each of them um, as well, um, because um, they're, whether they're erroneous headlines or not, they're there. Um, and there have been issues, particularly around auditors coming in. So. Um, if we're asking for additional public money from central government, there are certainly some of the criteria that I would need to see and our party would need to see before we become a position. Uh, and I appreciate you have been through a lot of detail and you've done a lot of work, and it doesn't surprise me that you've done this. And I'm really shocked that Ronan hasn't asked for money up front, but there you go. Um, <laughs> but 
but just to say that um, we, 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 we do need more information and I appreciate you were just you were asked to provide a briefing paper and it's certainly done that but certainly the presentation has also um, created more questions that need to be answered um, so uh, I wish as well and uh, look forward to seeing more information from you thank you thank you Carol um, I'll move on then to Robin any comment or question Thank you, Chair, and uh, like others, I uh, welcome the delegation uh, from, from Solis uh, to the Council. Uh, I'm not, uh, I was going to say I'll not, I'll not reiterate uh, what others have said, but I will. I, I want to pay tribute to the Councils. Um, I think, uh, at, particularly at this time, Chair, they have been uh, an effective uh, functioning uh, unit right across Northern Ireland, individual councils, and they have been essential um, in, in fighting this uh, very, very difficult situation that, that we're in. There's no doubt that they are the first point of, of contact for people. The Assembly is a bit more remote for, for, from people, uh, but their councillors and the council are the first per, point of contact. They're much more closer to the ground than we are as a legislative uh, assembly uh, and they have the ability uh, and they have been quick uh, to deliver uh, in this uh, emergency uh, so i think they deserve a, a lot of credit for their functioning over this past uh, number of months i would i would reiterate a word that you used uh, chair it would be shameful um, if at this stage we were to to let the councils uh, down uh, and indeed, in terms of the requesting of the assurances that they want on the seven points, uh, I think as far as the, uh, the position that, that, that I would be in and the, posi the position I hope that the Assembly will be in overall, that we would want to uh, provide those assurances. And indeed, where we can encourage, Chair, uh, and I, I can't remember which of the officers it was, who mentioned it, but to encourage the relationship uh, via the uh, communities uh, and indeed the Department of Finance in terms of not percentage uh, loans. And I think that that would be a very positive step if that can be done. I suppose in, in saying that, sure, I don't have a question. I only have one piece of advice, and that was, I think, to Ronan, who, who indicated that they were looking at uh, preparing a robust uh, forecasting model for perhaps up to two years. I would suggest to you, Chair, that uh, they might want to think about a three-year robust mm -hmm. forecasting model because uh, I think that's the, the scale of what we're talking about in this pandemic. Okay, thank you, Robin. Um, Sinead, have you any comment or question? Yeah, um, thanks, Chair. Just again, thanks to the members for their uh, presentation and to echo the sentiments around the, the good work that the councils are doing. You know, they are at the cold face, uh, not just at this time, just, uh, you know, in general, uh, they're at the cold face um, for people uh, across the north. But um, just a couple of observations, really. And, um, you know, Carol has said a lot of what I um, wanted to, to say as well. Just, you know, I am broadly supportive. And I'm saying this as a as an ex councillor myself, broadly supportive of the proposals that um, are in front of us today. Although, you know, I do have some reservations, as Carol has said, in terms of some councils' um, financial competency, should we say? Um, so, I would like to see um, in a further paper a wee bit more of a detailed breakdown uh, in terms of individual councils' um, financial standing at this time, because. While I know councils are always reluctant to dip into their reserves, um, I'm, I'm, I'm quite sure that some councils are sitting on healthy, healthy reserves um, and, and other councils have decided, you know, now is the time to, to use that money for, um, for, for services. So um, just to get that point across, so, um, you know, just would like to see just a little bit more detail just in terms of council's financial standing before we were, were to make any recommendation or come to any conclusion. Um, but, but just to say that I, I do know that um, councils are struggling, and as I say, I'm broadly supportive. And what we can't have is the ordinary ratepayer rate and the ordin ordinary citizen um, having to bear the brunt 
um, of the financial impact of this pandemic. We all know we have to play our part. We all know that you know things aren't going to be easily easy going forward, especially from a financial point of view for all of us. That includes repairs, but we don't want repairs bearing the brunt um, or bearing the, the burden of this this pandemic. As I say, I think councils have stepped up to the mark. However, I still think there are you know there are certain ways the councils can can help um, as well, and councils and central government. Um, I think extending the the planning application deadlines for for people would be would, would be one way of doing that. Um, and I would actually like to see Solis as, as a group um, approaching the Minister for Infrastructure and asking her to to formally consider legislation to do that. Um, because I don't think uh, citizens need another expense, another burden financially um, at this time. So, as I said, broadly supportive. Just need to see some more details. And thanks again for the presentation. Okay, thank you, Sinead. Um, Mark, have you any comment or question? Yeah, uh, thank you, Chair. I'd like to join with other members in commanding councils on their role in the response uh, to the, this pandemic to date. I mean, they've been very much <coughs> in the fight against coronavirus, and it hasn't been easy. Uh, I couldn't imagine that for one second. Uh, you're having to redesign services to second guess guidance coming from the executive and let's be honest about it that hasn't always been good but so you, you're trying to predict what services you can run how you can run them and, and there's a huge uh, groundswell or public demand for services to be open and you don't know when you can do it or, 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 or what you can do so councils have had to operate in, in, in that or under that kind of, of pressure and almost at times in, in a vacuum without leadership coming from the executive and mixed messages uh, coming from the executive uh, at the early stages of this outbreak. Even if like, if we look, I suppose, at the furlough situation, I mean, it's ridiculous that it took until uh, when it did the 1st of May, was it for clarity to be given uh, that council workers could be furloughed? You wonder what savings could have been made by councils. Uh, had they known that, that 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 scheme was accessible to them uh, earlier. Uh, now, I've looked at the figures that have been sent through. I've, I've listened to the presentation today. I certainly, having sat beside Alfie Dallas in maths class over 25 years ago, I wouldn't question the veracity of these figures, nor would I doubt his ability to bring forward the further information that some uh, members are re requesting. I think it's vital that there is work between departments on this, communities, finance, and yes, infrastructure. It's hard to think of a, of a department who doesn't work uh, with councils in, in, in some degree. But to date, I haven't seen much of that collaboration across departments either. I mean, I'd put a question on to the finance minister as well as uh, communities minister last week on uh, local government and just got the answer back from finance yesterday that basically saying this is nothing to do with us, it's community. Now I don't know how councils can have nothing to do with uh, the Department of Finance, yet whenever there's a positive announcement uh, or money to be given to hospices, that that has something to do with finance uh, rather than, than health. So I, I mean I do think councils have been pretty shabbily treated here. There are still questions, I'm sure some councils, and I know Alfie will have this one too, will have about the level of rate support grant uh, that, that, that they can expect this year that's compounding the significant pressures that they are re already on. And I think uh, you know, not only do departments have to work together here, we have to work together along with Solus, along with NILCA, along with uh, the, the councils. And... You know, I can understand, of course, no one wants ordinary citizens to bear the brunt of this pandemic. We don't want them to bear the brunt financially. But let's be realistic. What happens if some of our councils go to the wall? I think that's what we need to, or Solace need to actually spell out in layman's terms. What are the implications for jobs? What are the implications for services? And what are the implications for society? And it's hard to imagine that citizens won't bear the brunt of it if there isn't intervention uh, from, our, 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 from the Assembly and the Executive on this, and if that intervention doesn't come quickly. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Okay, David, do you want to just answer that final point of, of Mark's? Uh, certainly, Chair. Uh, look, we, we are all uh, working on our respective financial action plans. I suppose it, it all sort of the thread running through there in terms of the, the level of detail. The, uh, there was a huge amount of work went into this submission, and uh, obviously Alfie sort of laid that on our behalf. Uh, a high level of detail has already been shared, and we would expect that there's the highest levels of scrutiny on that. But it's, it's a dynamic situation, it's an understatement. It's not just the, the COVID-19 dynamic and the economic dynamic. It's a cause and effect. So different councils with a different level of reserves, as Alfie alluded to, sustainable for between, let's say, four to ten months if you, if you just use the reserves and nothing else. Decisions required, not just around the furloughing of staff, but there's all, some councils have already released these staff have decided not to bring casual staff in for the summer months. So all of those, all of those different uh, dynamics are at play. Then looking at discretionary spend, and that takes us to a point uh, where each council is looking at that deficit between what, what it currently uses uh, by way of expenditure to provide services what the absolute minimum requirement is for essential services. And I suppose if we just really cut it right back to the quick, uh, it could end up with a situation where a number of decisions are made that lead councils to just providing what really we're providing at the start of the crisis, which is lifting the bins, burying people, and registering births, deaths, and marriages. And pretty much everything would be throttling back on your, uh, your plan, throttling back on the Really, be moving to a place where, where it's minimum services. Um, obviously, depending on the success of furlough, the grants which come through the CFIS, with any assistance that may or may not come from central government, would allow you to move from that de minimis position into various increased levels of of uh, of, of, of service delivery. So, it's, like as I said, it's a, it's a very dynamic situation. I think the next few weeks, uh, all councils will be will be increasingly clear on how long uh, they can sustain uh, the current service. You've broken up on us, David. You've disappeared. Uh, uh, sorry, can you, can you hear me now, I sir? can hear you now. I can hear you now. Yeah, uh, yeah sorry. Uh, I'll just conclude by saying and I would expect in the next few weeks that all councils will have much clearer uh, visibility on, on, the, on the, uh, the financial impact and also, I, I would expect that we will be able to share more detail with committee in relation to all of the questions raised uh, during the discussion. Can I, can I just ask a question? Maybe um, it's one for uh, Ronan and Alfie. Um, the furlough, and it is, it is, it is bad that it wasn't clarified until the 1st of May that staff could be placed on furlough. Um, but tell me this, and I'm only asking, I don't know the answer to it, and maybe you do. Um, any of those staff that were um, shielding or were, had underlying health issues, can their furlough be backdated? Can council claim that back to the beginning of the furlough scheme, or is it just from the first, or from when they put someone on the furlough? Um, I'll come in there. We're, we're obviously working through that at the minute. We're working on the premise that it can be backdated. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, it's obviously a scheme we need to apply to, and um, HMRC will ultimately be the, the, the decision maker on that. I suppose there's no guarantees around that. None of this is guaranteed. It will be up to HMRC to make that decision. Yeah, I mean that's absolutely. that's correct, and also the fact that you have to show that this is in, that these staff are paid for primarily through fee income, um, and not through the rate um, itself. So um, you know, so it's not all staff that this can apply to by any means. No, I'd forgotten about that because it is it, it can't it has to be through um, income that they're that right. that they're paid for. Yeah, so it does make it a little bit more complicated again. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. I'm going to just quickly ask, we've only got this room until 10 to 3, I've been told at the minute. Um, so I'm going to just quickly ask members on the phone if there's anything they want to come back at there, but very, very quickly, first and foremost. Carol, I'll start with you. Uh, just, I, I or Mark, go ahead. I should have declared and I'm just in my wife as a council employee. Okay, yeah, that's fine. No problem. Um, 
Carol, if you anything you want to come back or every uh, Robin, Sinead, anything else? Yeah, yeah, just very quickly. Um, it would be helpful um, if solid could provide us with um, any uh, legislation that needs to be brought forward by infrastructure there or communities in relation to um, certainly planning um, or anything else, you know, because like up until now, I think most of the emergency legislation has come through communities. Yeah. So I'm not sure if the plan on that back was through that or not, uh, but certainly that would have something given the fact that the construction industry is starting to go back again, yeah. albeit with restrictions. That will be helpful as well, please. Okay. Yeah, no problem. We've been talking about that. So we've no problem in doing that. Okay, Johnny, you wanted to come back on something? Yeah, no, one point, uh, I think a couple of members mentioned about council's reserves and the indication that, that some councils were more generous in how they've been dealing with COVID-19. It hasn't been my experience. I don't know if there's particular examples, but I think it shouldn't. the message shouldn't go forward that because councils are sitting in healthy reserves that it's a bad thing. It's frugal management of public money, and that should be welcomed. For those councils that are sitting on unhealthy reserves, I very much welcome that money management matter. But in relation to the, the local government regulations that we put through as a committee, is the consensus with Solus that you were content with those regulations, that they've allowed now councils to have the flexibility that's needed to meet? Because we as a committee did mention about the need for proxy voting, for example. We did, I don't know if we got any information back on that from the department, but I thought, given the way it is in the Assembly, that that might be something that's useful to you guys uh, within your respective councils going forward, that ability to allow a group leader to vote on behalf of those members that are shielding or as party bloc. David, um, Suzanne, either uh, or? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll just, uh, as, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we're, we're sort of in live testing uh, mode at the moment, having just come out of a, a council meeting last night. And uh, as, uh, as I've referenced in the report, uh, the 11 uh, autonomous decision-making authorities all have a, a slightly different way of doing things and slightly different approaches to delegated powers and the role of, of group leaders. So uh, I'm not shirking the question. My experience was, was good last night, and I have to have feedback from group leaders this evening. Uh, we haven't really done a formal review collectively because I think it's only four councils who have used the new uh, regulations. Uh, so uh, I, I, over the next week, uh, all of the councils will presumably uh, take, their, uh, take the opportunity for holding a council meeting virtually, and then off the back of that, we can review it and feed back to the department. Um, Suzanne may have a, have a view on this. Yeah, I think I think we probably have to test out how this is going to work over the next couple of months, um, and then come back um, to you with whether or not there is a need for um, a change in in the regulations so that we can operate a bit more like um, Stormont. But um, we do have some flexibility, you know, as long as we um, have a quorum um, and uh, we can uh, look at, at all sorts of proportionality. Um, uh, models um, for um, attendance and voting as well. So we, I think we do have the flexibility already, um, although it's not specified um, as, as definitively as it is for Stormont. So I think we just need to test it out and review it for a couple of months. Okay. Look, thank you. Um, Chair, Chair, can I just... Uh, yep. Chair, I, I'm going to have to go off to this for another meeting. Can I just say, just a, we, we, unless, this, unless the Assembly works in partnership, with the councils, and I mean a true partnership with the councils of mutual respect and support, then we are going to find it even more difficult uh, to get through this uh, pandemic on behalf of all uh, the ratepayers uh, right across businesses, right across uh, the whole of Northern Ireland. No, thank you. I appreciate that, uh, Robin, as well. Look, can I just um, finish this part off, because we are under a bit of time pressure here also. Um, can I just say a, a, a thank you to David, Suzanne, Alfie and Dronan. Um, I, I would imagine that this will be um, something that the committee will want to come back and look at, certainly before summer recess. Um, I think we would we would be wise and it would be right of us um, just to watch this as it goes along um, uh, and just to, to help where we can. Um, what I will propose uh, just to let just for the, 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 the ones that uh, for the, the council our solace people there um, what I would be hoping to do then um, is we will send your paper off to 
the Minister um, for Communities um, after, our, after our meeting today. And then we would then hope to have you maybe back again then uh, before summer recess um, to give us an updated brief as to the situation of councils then. Um, but certainly any information that we have asked for during this meeting, um, I, I know the clerk will be in contact with yourselves um, for any updates or any further information that we could require. So on that, so I'll just say thank you and goodbye to our members uh, that, have, that have phoned in from Solace. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members, are members content with that approach that we, we send this paper on to uh, the minister and then we, we just uh, watch this as it goes along? Um, I do agree we do need more information. Um, we need more information on the position of each council. Um, so I think that that is something that uh, we'll put we'll pencil in um, for a future meeting, certainly before summer recess. If members are in agreement with that, first of all, on the phones. Agreed. Mm -hmm. Okay, agreed. In the room. Agreed. Chair, just just on the point, I, I think it would it would be uh, given the financial pressures that we're hearing and how critical it is of a nature. It, it would be good to hear from the minister as soon as possible as to what her department is considering in relation to support packages because we've seen and I know that the situation is developing and, and there's statements released regarding uh, multiple support measures across the sector but I, I think given that we've listened to today and obviously we need them to supply councils to supply more yeah. information but we do need to hear from the minister relatively soon as to what the approach is going to be because we we're hearing of this dire concern. No I, I don't disagree with that um, I right. think that was a, a paper that came forward was there 16 16.5 million or something that the minister had bid for um, but that 16.5 million is not going to be enough kelly no, no, but that so, was for the first three months yeah um i, I, I believe that that was refused by yeah. Yeah. And i i understand we, we, but what i would like to hear from the minister is exactly what is what is going on in terms of support packages and where she is with that. I, I think the last I heard there was communication both with communities and finance as to what sort of package will and, be available. And just further, I mean, I, I do know this will be a, a, a collective decision across uh, across the executive. It, it just doesn't fall on the minister's doorstep. This this is for um, the executive to look at because every, as somebody had said earlier, you know, there's, there's, there's not much there's not many of our departments that don't have some impact um, with councils. Um, so yes, I do think we will send this paper off. I do think, yes, I would like the minister to come along and brief us on this, but I want her to have that information and that conversation at executive level as well, um, if members are in agreement on that. Um, members on the phone, sure. anything that you need to say? Sure. Yep. Sure. It's just, it, he actually just took the words out of my mouth. I think we need we need to be getting a response from all um, executive ministers as to what measures they can bring forward in terms of, you know, um, uh, lessening the financial burden on, on councils at this time. So, yes, while the sole responsibility obviously is with the Minister for Communities, I think we need a response from, from, every, from every department. Well, then we then could agree to send on the solace brief to all departments um, for their information, if that is, would be useful. Yes, please. Okay, members. Are members content with that and we can move on? Great. Okay. Yeah. Okay, members, I'm going to then move on to um, tabled paper SL1, the Social Security Coronavirus Electronic Communications Amendment in Northern, Northern Ireland 2020. The proposed rule is at page six of your table papers. Um, this will allow those affected by the pandemic to claim state pension credit at a time of their choosing and without having to leave their homes. It will therefore assist those older members of the community who are self-isolating and those who are shielding at this difficult time. Members, can I ask if there are any comments or you are content that the rule be made? Content. All content in the room? Yes? Content. Okay, thank you. Then I'll move on then to agenda item seven which is SR 2020-74, the Local Government Coronavirus Flexibility of District Council Meetings, Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020. Um, a copy of this rule is at page 163 of your packs. The committee considered the SL1 at its meeting on the 29th of April, when members were content for the department to proceed to make the rule. Can I ask members, have they any objection to the rule? Firstly, in the room, no objection on the phones. 
Okay, then I'll put the following question that the Committee for Communities has considered SR 2020-74, the Local Government Coronavirus Flexibility of District Council Meetings Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules Report has no objections to the rule. Okay, members moving on to item 8, SR 2020-77, the Local Government Pension Schemes, or Pension Scheme Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020. You'll find this rule at page 174 of your committee pack. The committee again considered these regulations on the 29th of April and was content for the rule to be made. These regulations amend the Local Government Pension Scheme, Northern Ireland regulations to correct drafting errors contained in the LGPS Amendment Regulations. Um, Northern Ireland 2019, SR 2019-206. Um, can I ask then, have members any objections to the rule? First of all, in the room. No objections on the phones? Agreed. Okay, thank you. I'll then put the following question that the Committee for Communities has considered. SR 2020-77, the Local Government Pension Scheme Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020, and subject to the Examiner of Strategy Rules Report, has no objections to the rule. Okay, members, I'll move on then to item number nine, which is correspondence. You'll see the correspondence memo is on page 182, 182 of your meeting packs. There is also a tabled item of correspondence at page 11. Um, I would propose that this the item, this item, the, what the correspondence at page 11 of your tabled item, I propose that that is forwarded to the department for comment. Um, can I ask any members in the room, first of all, do you want to bring anything to the attention of the committee um, in correspondence? Can I just check, where are you getting the page 11? Page 11 of your tabled items. Five pages. Let me see. Oh, sorry, maybe I'm looking at that. Oh. There were two. Correspondence. Yeah, correspondence, page 11, 9.11. Do you find it, Kelly? Sorry, yes. And that's, we want to just send that on to the department. Okay, members content in the room with that. Okay, can I go to the members on, la on telephone? Are you content with that process so far? What we're proposing? Content. Okay, thank you. Um, let me see. Uh, then go to the cor correspondence memo in general. And can I ask then, first of all, in the room, are members con content with the correspondence memo in general? Yep, yeah. in the room? Yes. Thank you. Okay, can I then go to members on the phones? Are you content with the correspondence memo? Content. Content. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm going to move on then to agenda item number 10, which is AOB. Uh, I know, Kelly, you had wanted to bring up an issue in relation to Sport NI. I can't remember what it was going to be, sorry, Chair. Uh, that was to bring them, uh, ask them to oh, come in and give sorry, a brief. It was, yeah. Yes, it was to ask them to come forward to give a presentation um, just in regards to um, the issues that sporting bodies are having and, and the way forward. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. Um, any members uh, on the phones have any AOB they want to bring up? Nope. Nope. Okay. No. Sure. Can I sure. just... we, we asked some time ago, if you remember, about legislative programmes. Um, we wrote to the, I think it was the Minister of Infrastructure and the Executive. Yes. Um, I think even just for the solid presentation and with past councils, it would it'd be really important that we do that as well in writing. Um, because if there are issues, it's cross cutting, it's quite obvious that it's cross cutting issues, but particularly in relation to the potential cost of uh, planning applications, particularly on people at this time, would need to know what that is. And if there are any plans to bring forward uh, emergency legislation to look at that, um, I think the committee would definitely support that, but we need to know what it is. Okay. So we can write to uh, the Minister for Infrastructure. Yeah, we can do we can do that because I think there, there's there's uh, I think it was it I can't remember which member had brought that up um, about uh, the, about councils and uh, planning problems that they're having within councils. So it's just to get a wee bit more information on that. I know the minister for infrastructure did uh, remove the the 
the, the uh, need for public consultation of the planning process, but I think that was the only thing that really changed uh, under those powers. Um, so I don't know if there are any, if she has any plans to make any other changes on that or not, I suppose we can ask. Um, Johnny, did you want to come in? Yeah, no, it's just probably, for an, I know it's probably not the, the time in terms of, because it's we're, we're very much focused on the, on the COVID-19, but we did have a presentation at the time from the supporting communities, I think it was, in relation to the charity commissions, and I did express concerns at, at that. And, and the need of the earliest convenience to convene a meeting with them after the, the yeah. legal process, just to keep a watching brief on that and when it does become an appropriate time that we do, because I, I know there is a lot of concern among charities as to their status, given the court rulings. Yeah, no, well, and yes, that is important, though at the moment we have yeah, to stick to COVID-19 related issues. Um, can I just then... That, so, one more item. Um, That's okay. All I want is for it formally put on record. This is very difficult for me here. Um, I don't know about the rest of you, but the system that's been used to run committees, I, I come to the committee um, because it's easier. Um, but the feedback that we're getting from this telephone system is really poor. I know that the Assembly's looking at a video conferencing system. It was used in the business committee. It may not solve the question, but if we could um, formally, as a committee, ask that, that something is done, you know, I, I don't know what's going on with this speaker here today, but um, the feedback on it, I think for everybody, it's not just me with hearing aids. It's no, it has been extremely bad today again, the sound in here, but just before I go off what we're talking about business first, um, I think then, um, following on from your query about Sport NI, mm -hmm. Um, and the money that has been um, allocated there and then the money to the arts sector as well. Would members be of agreement that we would then hold or ask for uh, witness sessions on each of those from those relevant bodies, from the Arts Council and from Sport NI, um, just to, to let us know, give us an update on where that money has been spent or was going to be spent on. Um, would that be useful for members? Yes? Agreed? Okay. Members on the phone agree with that? Agreed, um, Chair, and again, it's all COVID related, so we just don't go off and wander off as there's a tendency to do. What, sorry, say that again, Carol? I'm just saying that any presentation we're doing is particularly in relation to COVID. Yeah. Well, this is what um, this is. The Arts Council funding and the Sport NI was money then that was given to them um, as part of this for sports clubs and then to help out um, those in the arts. So that's why I've asked for a briefing on that. If that's okay. Another um, thing I want to then make members um, aware that the voluntary, um, the charity voluntary and community sectors, um, I've uh, scheduled a briefing for them for hopefully the tw or not. I have I haven't. I asked your permission if we can schedule a briefing for uh, the twentieth of May. Is that next week? It is next week. Yeah, next Thursday, um, and that will be CO three in Nikva. Um, to come in and give us a brief on on how they are, what they're um, how they're standing at the moment. I know there's some issues around the voluntary and community sector, and I know that the voluntary community sector also has been brilliant um, during during this pandemic and have done a heck of a lot of work, and the, and the department are working along with them on that. So um, if members are content for next week, then we'll have that briefing from CO3 and Nickver. And members agreed with that. Agreed. Yep. Agreed, Chair, but can I just say that CO3 and NICFA don't always represent the, the, the community voluntary sector grassroots level. I'm, ha I'm happy to hear what they have to say, but certainly, you know, the, the when you look at even the food banks and the delivery of the food parcels, it's been done by people in neighbourhood renewals and you've and is at risk right across the, the board. So um, maybe at some stage we can consider that also. No, and I do understand that, but there, there are, have been, I know there have been other issues to do with some of those specific voluntary and community groups and charities um, that due to the COVID-19, um, they have been inundated with their own service users um, around queries and questions as well um, that are, you know, haven't been necessarily to do with um, you know, the, the likes of food boxes and, and that reach out in the community. It's been their own service users um, have had a lot of, of questions and they've seen a, certainly a, a great increase um, in, in telephone calls and various other things that they're having to react to at this time. Um, so I suppose it's just for a general overview as well, Carol, of, of you know, how they're managing too, you know, if that's okay. 
Yes, no bother. No bother. Okay, um, members, where are we now? Have I, have I anything further to do here, Kevin, to keep me right? Um, oh, uh, useful if we could get a further update on the departmental expenditure of COVID-19. Um, it's just there has been, and I know we did get that infographic through of the amount of, of uh, expenditure and calls and the increase in work for the department. Um, I just think it would be useful because there has been a heck of a lot has gone out from the Department of, for Communities, which is great. And we're not knocking that in any way. That has been brilliant. There's been a great response. Um, I just think it would be good if we could just get an update from the, de the department then on just what has been spent uh, and where that money has gone to, um, just uh, to help us follow that a bit easier. Um, if members are in agreement with that also, if we can ask for that. Agreed. 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 Okay. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to then finish there. I think that's us finished then. We're ready to go to date and time of next meeting, which I don't have in front of me, but I know what it is. It's next week. Um, <laughs> next Thursday, the twin, or Wednesday, sorry, Wednesday at one o'clock in room 29. <laughs> thank you very much, members. Thank you. Sure. Thanks, bye -bye. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Uh, thank you. Bye. Uh, Committee room. Why I didn't print that page. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.